All righty, folks. Welcome back to the Mushing Alaska podcast. We're your hosts, Brendan and Sean. It's always a pleasure to be back with you. Sean, how's it going, dude? Dude, it's a lot of there's a lot of sled dog races happening. It's hard to it's hard to <laughs> you got to you got to keep it's it's a lot of work being following these races. You know, it, yeah. it's yeah, uh, it's almost like I mean, it's way easier way easier to follow the race than it is to be there in it but yeah true true it's 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 like four consecutive weekends of big racing uh and nick copper basin cusco just ended quest is coming up it's like oh and some of these guys are running you know three out of four of those races or i wonder if anyone's running all four like people I, we're going to i think but i doubt it I, yeah I, doubt I don't i honestly don't think that anyone because from Pesco like no one no one has run all three i don't think you know what i mean like i think there yeah. are a few who have run uh two of the first three right yeah but yep. i don't think anyone has run all three already so you're right uh, gosh i couldn't imagine how like that wouldn't i mean you wouldn't do that to a dog team, dude no you? wait dude oh yeah you could do that if strong dog team and plus you're probably not taking the same 12 dogs every time but yeah, you got if you've done if you you know if you're not running at each race competitively or you know or they're that well good of a team. I mean, yeah, it's all just kind of depends on on a lot of things. But certainly, a, a good dog team could do all three races. Maybe not compete to win every one, but maybe yeah. I don't know. I mean, Lance did it with the two two one thousands in a row, winning. So right, you know. Um, but I think there is somebody that ran all three off the top of my head, off the top of the dome. And I think that would be Hunter Keith. But this was this Cusco was the first one that he ran that was his A team that for I did a rod. That is true. Cusco, he did the basin and he did the connect. Yeah. Okay. So I stand corrected. And that steel means trap. oh steel, steel trap. trap. Yep. Okay. All right. But he's not in the quest. So he's not running all four. But I mean, shout out to three in a row. That's that's a shout out to Hunter. Yeah. And dude, I mean, we're going to get into the Cusco, uh, but such a strong showing from from him, you know, uh, and you kidding me. So but all right, before we get into everything, all right, try to keep us on track. And and before we like get into the all of this, I wanted to air. I wanted to air a gripe. I have a a complaint, right? You know, so, you know, I guess I represent like the couch mushers. I represent the people that kind of like this, but don't know too much about it. Um, You know, I don't see much snow or anything like that living in Atlanta. So you guys this week, I'm recording from Salt Lake city, Utah for here for a work conference. And literally, because Georgia is a joke when it comes to snow this whole time that I've known, I've had this work trip. I'm like, all right, well, this is going to be like my one opportunity for the year, for the season, right. To actually experience snow, snow on the ground, not like snow in the mountains. And I get here the other day and it's 55 degrees. And I'm just like, (laughs) there goes any chance of any snow that I have to see. I took a hike today for my hike. I was proud of myself, Sean. You're probably like, that's weak sauce, but. uh, Four miles is a long time, dude. Well, you know, like I'm here in the city, but it's like literally the mountains are right there. So uh, I found a trailhead and went up there and got a group of us to go and so that was the closest thing I got to snow. That's sick, dude. Hey, you know, but uh so anyways i just was like i'm sure we have a few listeners not in alaska that are similar in the fact that they maybe don't have a lot of snow and so maybe they can relate to like oh man i'm gonna get this chance to get some snow i'm gonna you know like not be here for too long so not have to deal with the the uh some of the bs of having snow around or whatever and i don't even get a chance for that so yeah just just thought I would bring that up before we, you know, take a deep dive, you know, where 
you might talk for like 25 minutes straight and I might. No, I wouldn't. I never do that, dude. Yeah. yeah all right, whatever. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do before we got into everything is I wanted to congratulate Matt Reese from our fantasy mushing group for the Cusco 300 uh shout out to those of you who are new and signed up we went from 12 people in our group to 17 and i'm just gonna real quickly pull up matt reese's winning team because matt i have an issue all right your boy over here he selected the number one team the number two team the number three team the number six team and the number 15 team and got 10th fucking place. Excuse my language, but I'm a little upset about that. I mean, I, we talked about it uh, before. I, I was first place in regular fantasy football and lost first round. And now I just picked the first, second, third, and sixth team and am in 10th place. It's kind of a joke. But uh, anyways, here is Matt's winning team. Matt Reese, first place. Let's go ahead and view this. So he picked not first and second and third like me. Um, first place, Pete Kaiser. Third place, Travis Beals. Seventh place, Ryan Reddington. Dude, I think that the thing of that made him win more than anything was having Ryan on his team. Because Ryan was like in the lead for two-thirds of the race, and you get points for first to checkpoints and fastest run times. So he had the fastest run time for the first two runs. So these are these are things I did not know. Okay, you're yeah, yeah, well, you might want to check the rules on like how how oh you you're telling me I might really... want to check the rules. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm there. All right. Okay. <laughs> Take a deep breath. All right. I'm just saying that it's I wish personally that it was you know the team that based on where they finish is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that is certainly a big point collector, but yeah, you're doing fastest run times and first in the checkpoints and, you know, Ryan, that's a lot of points. I bet yeah. you let's, uh, it says what their score is, you know, Ryan finished in seventh. Is that, so it says their score was, well, yeah. So he got 292 in seventh place, whereas Travis Beals only got 236, but he was in third place. So that's a prime right. example of what you're saying. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Well, it makes sense. And regardless of the sense that it makes, and I do appreciate your explanation of it, I'm still slightly bitter. Uh, but moving bitter. moving on, I also will quickly give a shout out to Matt McAllister, our winner from the what, Copper Basin 300. This dude is consistent. Um, so... He hit him and Matt Reese. These two mats are uh, holding it down for us, but just wanted to give you guys uh, some props and um, you guys will get your shirts coming your way and all of that. And that'll continue to be a thing. We have, we have some shirts. We'll, we'll be happy to give those away as a way to get you guys to uh, join our group and just something fun. And uh, you know, maybe we'll work our way up. Maybe we'll have a uh, some sort of thousand dollar gift card or something down somewhere down the road. But I don't think we're quite there yet, right, Sean? Uh, you know, I <laughs> well, I can't say that we are. Um, I do want to shout get let let Matt know. You know, I I've, I've spent some time during the Connect Two Hundred with Matt R Rice. Oh, and I didn't know that was his last name. Excuse me, Matt Rice. I said Reese, I don't know. My bad. I don't know. We I think we pronounced it three different ways and probably all wrong, but. I think it's Ries, I believe it Ries. is what it is. Okay. Um, no, I have no idea. But uh he was like he had some serious like stats on like you know, because he just showed up. This is his first winter handling, I think, in Alaska. And he uh was like going tat for tat with me on like who won the last 15 I did or odds because we were just like up and out, out, you know, up at three in the morning, just shooting, shooting the shit about oh you remember this year well, he did this and he did that and i was impressed with what he knew and how much he's researched online and so he's clearly like a, i'm not surprised that he ended up winning this cusco so good job matt shout out to matt 
Yes. The man knows his stuff. Oh, Brennan is so bitter. <laughs> and I'm still bitter because, bro, <laughs> like, I mean, I one, two, three, shit, one, two, three, six, man. Like, uh, I was kind of going through every single person. I don't think anyone got one, two, three, six. But, you know, <laughs> anyways, uh, let's move on. Uh, and let's talk about the Cusco 300. Um, and, you know, Sean was not at this one, you guys. So we didn't have all the, you know, footage for you guys and stuff. But listen, Kale Casey, he's got us covered. If you haven't, if you haven't gone and seen anything, go check his stuff out. Facebook and YouTube. Um, it's exquisite. We're going to get Kale on. We're going to have to interview him. Yeah. I'm sure you guys. I texted love- him yesterday. Oh, here we go. We're as, as, I just, you know, seeing how it went. Plant the seeds. Stuff. So, okay. yeah, um, he's going out. He's going to be gone for most of March, so we got to get him on here in the next couple of weeks. But, yeah, yeah. it'd be nice. Yeah, uh, it'd, be, it'd be a fun uh, fun episode that would fly right by because, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, a, uh, he's, a, he's a legend and he, he, knows how to, he knows how to talk about dogs and about races, and he's been there and done that and at all these events and uh, knows the – I'm really impressed with considering he hasn't run, you know, any big races and he seems like to kind of understand all the nuances of what's going on out there. And, you know, he snow machine, the entire Iditarod trail. Right. You know, so he's, 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 we're going to, we'll get him on. So yeah, I'm looking forward to to some of his coverage out there in Bethel. And, you know, he, he was, he, he wasn't, given the green light to just go and be up and right underneath the start and starting shoot. So he did what he could with the, you know, permission he was given. And so you had your main Cusco KYUK coverage and then supplementally was Kale and he had drone footage and really amazing shots. There's like a, this one, I, I wish we, sh- I wish I would have remembered this beforehand, but there's this like drone shot. Maybe we could find it on his YouTube um, of Hunter's team on the Cuscoquim and it's just like an, uh, like an all time, all time shot, you know, just right above the, it looks like his, his drone is following the team perfectly, but he's like manually doing it. It was pretty cool. All right, baby. Let's full send this. I think I got it. Oh, really? this, let it's me Hunter, see. Yeah. It's Hunter's team. And, it's a, I, what I've pulled up is a 30 second clip. So even if I miss hit, I mean, it's only 30 seconds. Yeah. Uh, sorry to those of you who are not watching on YouTube, but it's so all you, all you literally have to do is go to YouTube and type in Kale Casey, Hunter Keefe. And it's one of the first things that I found. So uh, let's go ahead and pull, pull this up. And it's my first time seeing it. Uh, boom. We're not going to listen to the sound, but let's just, uh, uh, Sean, I, I can, this, I can do the sound about... in a world in Southwest Alaska, 300 miles of hard and fast trail this winter, three weeks into January, one man stands five foot seven inches tall. I think ish <laughs> decided that he could be the fourth fastest team in the Cusco 300. Mic drop. Excellent job, <laughs> Sean. That was, dude, that I'm going to have to clip that up and put that out. That was so good. Um, so yeah, shout out to Kale. We're going to get him on. I'm excited to uh, uh, talk to him. He, as many of our guests are, are, Uh, he's uh, one where I'm like, man, I wish we were doing this in person. I wish I was in Alaska. I wish I was like all three of whoever it is. We're all together and just like having that much more of a better connection and whatnot. But, uh, we've rambled on long enough. Let's go ahead and pull up the Cusco. I was going to go ahead and see, uh, if we should go ahead, do the, I'm going to pull up the results here real quick. So those of you watching can see that and uh while i'm doing that sean just initial thoughts off the bat of what you uh some of your takeaways were from from the race this year well 
no surprise that Pete won it again. You know, that's Sneaky what Pete. everybody predicted. I think the one of the most incredible parts about his win is that he won with uh, without dropping any dogs. Uh, he did end up having a bag of dog um, to take a little nap in the sled uh, for the part of the last run. But to win this race with 12 dogs, everybody behind him finished with eight, nine, seven, six uh, yeah, dogs, the most except, was except 10. for uh, 10 was uh, Hunter. And yep. so, yeah, Kaiser is just a total master of this trail. Um, if he's going to train and I mean, he could just do this. I feel like he can win this thing 20 times, um, but he still has one more win to go next year to tie Jeff King's nine wins at, at Cusco. So that's exciting. He's inching towards that. And uh, second place, Matt Failer. Like he has been super consistent He at this race. He's run, uh, I think he's been in second every year, except for the year that he had the fastest elapsed time ever in the Cusco history where he came in first. Um, and so he, you know, this this guy has he he's not been Pete Kaiser won the Iditarod. Matt Failure just got top ten for the first time and and after, you know, several attempts at getting cracking that top ten. So he's still figuring out, you know, how to get that long distance um competitiveness. And now he's got a little kid. So it, you know, maybe he's just gonna be out there moving forward enjoying the ride and maybe seeing if he can crack the top 10 again, maybe not, but and, with the Cusco man, he has it totally figured out. I mean, second place all these years in a row is really, really impressive. So I'm really proud of Matt and his dog team. He scratched in Knick earlier this month and he was like, you know, and he did, it, it was a conservative scratch. He's like, you know what? It's a couple of dogs getting a couple little soreness is here and there. I got Cusco coming up. And win 25 G's and get second place. I think so. Let's do it. So congrats to Matt. And there's something that I want to bring up, something that you and I were talking about, specifically about Matt. So, you know, he has had a lot of success in this race. And so my question was, you know, Sean's a lot more familiar with where they live and the location of where what that means that maybe the conditions of their training looks like. And so I'm like, well, he's done super well at this race. Like, does he, does he live there? Has he lived there? Does he have any connection to Bethel? And like outside of the race, he hasn't lived there before. And, you know, uh, so then I was like trying to theorize like, okay, well, what is it about this race that suits him? Because he has been so consistent in his results with this race. And uh, so I was like asking Sean, I was like, is it, is it the fact that the, this year's race and the year like that he set the time for the fastest race ever is the conditions are like nice and allow for him to run fast. And, um, and it sounds like maybe that's the case. I, I, I don't know if maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on, on what we were talking about there, Sean. Yeah, I, that's, I really don't know why he's gotten so, so good at this race. I mean, I think he kind of, he maybe has it kind of figured out when, when it comes to, you know, how to approach that first half of it. And I think it, it's, it's really easy to want to go. You didn't see Matt, he, Travis Hunter or Richie in no. front of this race until after 200 miles, you know, Ryan was winning 200 miles of this race and we'll circle back to that in a little bit, but yep. I think he's figured out exactly how to do the race strategy, which is really tricky. Um, and certainly it's gotta be that his dogs are just, able to do these fast long runs but I, I mean i really don't know it's just i think it really is a testament to his ability uh specifically because i think that there's a lot of dog teams that might have a similar maybe slightly maybe not quite as good as matt's team but maybe there are a lot of teams in here that are just as good as matt's but the difference is matt so it's uh, i think uh really impressive like what he's been able to do mentally in this event 
uh, so consistently. And I really don't know what it is. And I don't think Matt's going to tell anybody because you better keep it to himself and get we'll just, place next year. You we'll know? get him on and I'll ask him point blank. That's what we'll do. So, um, <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, Travis has never gotten this high in the race. He was, I think, uh, he, this was his goal is to try to finish high this year and he's did it. And then some third place is amazing. He's, he's been someone who in the past has gone out in front, kind of like Ryan did, and then ended up finishing way, way back. And, uh, and then this year you saw him kind of take taking it slower, which slower still 10 miles an hour, but uh, that first run. And I think it really paid off for him. And he, he had that really uh, tough connect 200 race. That was a really good training run. I think for the Cusco, because it's got a th- two 100 mile runs. So his team was just like, probably this was a good, um, they were just ready this team seemed, seemed like they're ready just based on what they've done. And Hunter Keefe is man, um, you know, an incredible race by him. I think he, he, he was talking to, um, you know, Eddie about strategy and, and getting as much help with the strategy of things, but, you know, credit goes to Hunter with his ability to train these dogs and get them ready. And he's got an amazing genetic line with the Reddingtons, but, you know, genetics, just medics, you got to train the dogs and he's been doing it for a couple of years, three, four, five years. I don't know how many years with this exact group of dogs, but he's clearly got something special going. And, and I, I feel like his, really proud of this. I feel like his fourth place finish was kind of quiet. Like he, he had a strong second half. He, he had was knocking down teams closing. Yeah. He passed um, a lot of teams late in the race. Yeah. Yeah, and I would also say similarly would be the case for the next person, Richie Deal. Um, yeah. I feel like his fifth place is, I mean, honestly, Hunter, Richie, and Katie Joe, those three, I, I feel I'm, like, super impressed with all of those. Um, but, like, Hunter and Richie, they the, the manner of which they did it was kind of, like, slow and steady from the first half and then came on strong from the second. But I was also really impressed with Richie. I, uh, I felt like he was kind of really, really at the bottom there for a little while, but boom, finished strong, you know? Yeah. He, it's just, a uh, the control that they have with, with, uh, these teams, you know, Richie probably saw something and he's like, I cannot send it this year you know, early on, I got to really take it easy and see how they look. And if they look good, let's maybe we can make a push towards the end. And yeah, I mean, I, I was like, oh man, Richie, this is like maybe one of his slower races in the last few years. Cause he's been such a regular up at the top of this race and a former him and Matt are the only people to have won this race in the last 10 years, whose name aren't Pete Kaiser. And, um, so, you know, it was a really strong finish for him. That's a good point, Brennan. And I think that you could argue that like the biggest story of this race is probably Katie Joe Do- uh Katie Katie Joe Dieter um coming in sixth place. You know, we saw her out there in second place behind Ryan coming into Upper Kalskag. Um and I was like, "Huh." You know, cuz Katie Joe and Jeff Dieter, they've had a, uh their kind of produced a top 15 I did or odd team, I believe, but they've never been like a regular name in the top of these competitive races, frankly. And they have a great kennel and great dogs, obviously, but this was like kind of a hello, I'm here moment for Katie Joe and, um, and Jeff. And we can kind of talk about this together. I mean, Katie Joe took the competitive team. They're married. If you don't know, and they've got their own kennel and, it's called, I think, Black Spruce Dog Kennel or something. And, uh, you know, Katie Joe took the competitive team and Jeff took the younger dogs, least experienced dogs, and still got 10th. So they got two, both. I mean, they got their A and their B team in sixth and 10th place. And Katie Joe, I mean, this is her rookie run. She's never done this. I, I think I saw a stat on yeah. Instagram from, um, I don't know who it must have been. Wade maybe at stump jumping kennel had said that she this is the highest finishing female musher in 20 years 
since Didi Genro in like 2002 or three. And um, this is like, I, this is huge. And you, so you see her out there in front, kind of towards the, in the middle of the race there. And you're like coming up into mile 200 and you know, you're like, Oh, she like, is this a bad idea? Like, you don't, you don't really know what's going on out there. You're just looking at the GPS, like, huh, this is like surprising. Like, I wonder if this is going to, you know, work out or if she's going to need to take some extra rest or what. And then she totally, any doubts that I might've had were completely erased by a sixth place finishing with dogs looking good. And, and so congratulations to the Dieters. Yeah, I, I fully agree on that. I was, uh, I was talking to Jess about, you know, she was asking me about the race and, uh, at that point it was your wife. Kate. Jess is my wife. For those of you who haven't pieced that together, um, who you ha- who ha- have not listened to every single entire episode that we've put out, yeah, I'm sorry that you haven't put that together. Um, but at the time it was Katie Joe and, um, Ryan Reddington. And, uh, like I was theorizing, I was like, maybe she's like trying to push Ryan to like, you know, maybe, tire him out and then like the rest of the gang will catch up. Cause like for me, and that this is a whole nother conversation as well. Sean and I were talking and we're talking about uh, at one point you probably can talk about where they were specifically in the race better than I was. But at one point I was like, man, it looks like Ryan, he's running away with this. And Sean was like, nah, dude, you want to bet a beer on this? And I was like, I mean, I'm, I'm like, I'm doing the math in my in my head, which is very limited in the world of mushing. And I'm like, I mean, okay, he I think we were talking about it. It's like, all right, well, he's got whatever, only seven more mandatory hours left and only X amount of miles left, whereas the people behind him have more mandatory time left and more miles left. And Sean was like, dude, it just wait and see and then like bam next day we woke up and like there it was i was like damn so just if you want to speak to that sean yeah i mean i think both ryan and katie joe didn't rest in antioch they went and spent three hours and their time start differential in calskag and then circled around and did it again in calskag at three hours and you know with ryan i i think uh, any any anybody watching was probably thinking all right the you know he's got three hours in Kalskag and sneaky pete's coming up with matt failer travis spiels hunter keith you know all, and all these guys are all left in a, an explosion of teams left antioch and so you're like all right it's kind of tricky to figure out the math how long is it going to take to go from antioch back to Kalskag, and how long is ryan resting and his team the reality is is You know, yeah, he got out way in front, but I mean, he ran 12 miles an hour for a hundred miles and it could have maybe worked out. You know, that's something that takes like an, like a dog team that could be Ryan's team, but like a Lance Mackey 2007 kind of team or through 2010, you know, that kind of team that to be able to pull off 12 miles an hour for a hundred miles and then continue to keep your speed for this 300 mile race. It's just like small small shot but it's possible and you never know until you try it and also really impressive that you know i don't know his team i didn't see pictures of the team or anything but i think that they did fine and they kept like a decent speed they were a mile an hour slower than everyone else but they seemed happy enough and and but you know he lost a little bit of speed and that's why he went from first to seventh um and you know, Katie Joe, she I don't think she was running like crazy fast, but she did do the unique strategy of doing the three and a half for this race. It was unique. The people that took three in Kalskag and three in Kalskag, uh, lower and upper. And she, yeah, she got in in second and you're, wonder, you're wondering, all right, is she going to leave in second? Probably not. There's going to be some teams that come by. And sure enough, she, you know, she only lost four spots, sixth place. 15 grand 10th place probably seven grand right so they're they paid for their trip and 
some kibble for a couple of days. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and yeah. And so then just without, you know, we'll look at, try to get the rest of these names in. Sure. Um, so I guess I'll just keep talking. Uh, <laughs> Riley did a really great race. Seventh place. Um, we've been wondering about, you know, eighth, eighth. Is, when is Riley going to become, uh, get, take that competitive step. And he's certainly gone for it and learned a lot. And you can see I, the, every year he, his team seems to be doing better and looking stronger. And all the teams that see him out there on the Willow and Knick trail system, I've been impressed looking at his team out there on the trail and shout out to the Willow Knick big lake area. Uh, we got Matt Failer, Travis Beals, Hunter Keefe, Ryan Reddington, Riley Dyke, all from that area, training in the same area. So that's like half the top 10 right there. Um, really impressive. And uh, Ramey Smith, I think this is a huge story that probably no one is realizing, but, you know, he – my it's I think it was kind of within the circles of mushing known that he didn't really have his team like on the low he was certainly on the lower end of mileage and he just took it slow in the beginning and built his team up and has incredible dogs. He's been doing this his whole life. He's just a quiet musher that's just out there loving his time out on the trail with the dogs, being competitive in these races. He's he's not the guy you're gonna see um with a sled dog tour or a long interview but here he is again still steady eddie ramey smith coming in ninth place at cusco um something we weren't sure he was going to be able to pull off this year nice and then uh in terms of the back half of this race, was there anything of note that kind of stood out to you or uh, anything that you wanted to kind of shout out? Yeah. Uh, you know, of course we had some scratches. You do it happens every year. You go for it on this race and, and sometimes it works and, and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, Dave Turner, Raymond Alexi and Jason Pavela, they all kind of went for it and, it didn't work out. They didn't like what they were seeing with their dogs. They wanted to win. They tried to win, but they're not. This isn't a machine that you just press the go button. These are living, hum, living, not human beings, but they feel like human beings. I wanted uh, to call you your out, best man. friends, but <laughs> you know, you they don't. So that they saw what they saw, they pulled the plug, and it's you got to respect it. Um, and Josh, and Neil, let me. Real quick, just let me jump in there and just we were kind of talking about that. Um, so this race, you know, it was the weather was really cold, right? And uh the trail was kind of packed down, and that makes it kind of faster for for the the conditions. And sometimes when in those conditions you're running your team hard and at that, that, you know, over that 10, 11 mile an hour, it can cause some like bru bruised up, uh, ankles and stuff. And isn't that kind of what, like, talk a little bit more about that. Um, yeah. So yeah, the hard trail, it's like running on cement. If you like, as a human, you're, if you're running a big miles on asphalt and cement, you're going to start to have problems with your joints. Um, so, you know, the easier it is and the less stress that you put on your body running those miles on that hard surface, the longer it'll be until you come up with an issue or maybe you won't at all. So those teams that um, go faster can be more prone to have these issues. Can. It's right. not black and white. No. But, you know. But you the would big would thing you... though is there's not really any like when it's cold and there was very little snow out there is hydration and so a lot of dogs were sent home early from this race because they mushers didn't like the amount of water that they were taking in they were like here's an opportunity to drink some water here's a meat snack here's a wet meal and they maybe had a little bit but they're like look I'm gonna ask a lot of you in the next twenty hours. And I don't like how much little water you drank. I'm, I got nine other dogs that are did great, ate great, 
ran great. I'm going to keep them. So I think hydration plays a huge role. You got these sorenesses that might start to creep up. And it's just long runs, man. They're super long runs. And sometimes, and and these guys, they're going for it. Right. And if you're going to go for it, I talk about this all the time. It's a small margin of error. Yep. And so sometimes you can pull it off and win the 2022 I did or I like Brent. Sometimes you try to do it again and you scratch. Sure. So, I mean, you can kind of say that about like Ryan pulled that off too. You know, he went yeah, for Ryan it. sent it last year yeah. and won. And then exactly. you look at other years, he sent it and he finished in 15th or didn't finish or, or but sometimes 10. he does, you know, now he seems like he's able to turn it around where he still can go for it. See the signs kind of before. I mean, they actually are a real problem, but you know, they're going to be right. And, dial it back and so like he's i'm impressed that he's ryan, learned he's learned ryan could have easily been right next to jason dave and raymond alexi maybe you know if he if if he missed some things in his team so he's uh, that's a testament to his ability to see what the dogs need when they need it and s- still try to be competitive but still get to the finish line and you know get the finish line with happy dogs going seven, eight miles an hour. I mean, that's respectable. And right. So, yeah. Um, but and yeah, we have to bring up Josh McNeil, man. I feel so bad yeah. for him, man. I really do. Yeah. Thorn rotator cuff out there on the trail. We don't really know exactly how the accident happened, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, it was dumb luck. Um, again, you know, just bad luck, you know, nothing, nothing against Josh and his abilities. You know, he's knows what he's doing out there, but shit happens. And yeah. so hopefully he can get well soon. He'd be ready for a rod. I think he was signed up for the quest 200, but he's not going to be running that. Maybe he'll get someone else from his kennel to do that. And, um, so yeah, tough news. Uh, I don't know who John Snyder is. I'm hope to learn more, but you know, he, he, uh, wasn't able to make it to the end there, but hopefully he can be back next year and, and, be stronger um joe taylor and you know he's a guy that alex was telling me about my buddy alex he yep. said oh we should get him on he's an iditarod veteran you know respectable finish i don't know he just quietly showed up to the race got 12 i mean i don't i didn't hear anything about joe taylor all weekend right and so really impressive what he's doing uh it seems like um he's got a good thing going and uh he started First with 10 dogs or no, he didn't start first. Right? He started with 10 dogs. That's a huge, huge disadvantage. I mean, you don't need two extra dogs to go any faster, but look, like I said, small margin for error out there on this trail and with this, with this little rest and this long a distance and impressive. Uh, Alexander Larson's a local out there, strong 11th finish, 11th place finish. Akleka grew up there. Jessica, um, I think, she, you know, that's a strong, and it's, it's, it's 13th place is impressive. I talked to her at Knick. She said, if you finish in the top 20 of this race, like that is like really, like it's going to be really hard to finish in the top 20. Cause all, look at all these amazing dog teams. Bailey Vitello has got a great dog team. He's, uh, you see him at a lot of these events now. I love, she seems to really love these off the road system. Hobuck and Cusco. Um, he had a good connect 200, so he's been doing well. Um, Gabe Dunham, I think she had, she's finished in the top 10 in this race before. I think she was hoping to be back in that realm, but you know, for one reason or another, she, she was sharing about it on Facebook. I think, you know, you can get, uh, maybe her dog team needed the extra S. Maybe she just needed to give her rest the extra dog. She just want, wanted to feel better about her team. You know, a lot of things are going out. You got to, you're getting emotional out there. You know, I'm not sure if that's what happened for her, but it happens to every musher. Um, and maybe, you know, her, she, th- she thought that her dogs needed a couple extra hours rest and she gave it to him. And what that's a win right there, if you ask me. Um, Dakota. You know, we knew he was going to be kind of a back of the pack kind of team. And it's cool to see him continually participating in these events. And you get, you finish in 
red lantern in this race and you're still making a couple grand hope, hopefully covering a lot of the bills for this event and uh peterson eb peterson who's a matt's peterson relative i don't know if it's his brother or what cousin um fin getting the finish and then um, the red lantern shout out to the the family name right there isaac baby <laughs> yeah he's uh lives in crooked creek alaska on the crooked creek yeah like the band song not cripple creek but crooked yeah, well you know close Up on crooked creek so really amazing race by all these folks out there and and uh it was really fun to follow really exciting really close teams were uh minutes apart throughout the whole race uh so it it's always exciting and and it was really fun i was just talking to all my friends in the mushroom community that were paying attention to this race and and we were just guessing who's going to do what and what's happening what are you seeing what are you thinking you know it's tough to it, you you see who's first in the halfway point and it, it usually isn't very indicative of who's actually gonna what the top fives are gonna actually look like at the finish so it's fun yeah and it was fun you and i just like going back and forth and you know then like i go to bed and like our little text message group were exchanging texts <laughs> and all of a sudden like when i wake up i I wake up to like 16 texts and i'm like oh hell yeah this is like everything i missed when i was when i was asleep overnight while you guys are still awake with the four hour difference so uh yeah that was that was a fun race and uh you know congrats to to pete we're gonna have to get pete on at some point he's he's definitely another one that in that i think would be fun to have on and um so just kind of someone another name to add to the to the ever lifting ever awesome. ever a long growing list of of people we want to get on so um anything else that you want to mention before we wrap up the cusco i think we i think we did good i, I mean you know, it's tough to cover up such an epic event in 30 minutes or whatever, but I hope you guys enjoyed following that race and we sure did. 100%. Um, all right. So, you know, we've been rambling for a little while already, uh, but we've got a huge weekend of, of races coming up. Um, and so, Sean, what are you thinking? Where do you, let's talk a little bit about it, but let's maybe uh, like, we're going to cover these races in the intro of our next episode as well. Right. So we'll be happy to maybe go into more detail and provide more, more time to these races. But um, I did want to at least kind of briefly talk about them before we talk about our, uh guest for this episode yeah uh i think so the yukon quest is happening yep this weekend uh the yukon quest you think yukon you think canada so when you're looking up the yukon quest if it says just yukon quest that's the canadian side if it says yukon quest alaska of course that's the alaska side um but there's three events in in each uh, what the, the, there's three starting in Fairbanks and three that are starting in Whitehorse. Whitehorse is in the Yukon territory, and um, the three in Alaska we'll start with. So there's okay. Uh, the Yukon Quest Alaska has the smallest event is the Yukon Quest eighty, and I I'm I don't really know. Uh, you know I don't typically follow super closely to the shorter distances just because my experience with sled dogs has been I, I don't i'm not an expert at an 80 mile race i think i'm maybe almost kind of an expert at the mid distance and long distance and what it takes to be um successful or in those races um and i don't know an expert that's kind of lame i don't like that i said that all right but Move anyways light. I'm not an expert. Please, 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 please move on. I'm sorry, guys. Okay. I didn't mean that. All right. 
Anyways, then there's the, so Emily Robinson, you know, we had her on. So, you know, she's in the quest 80 and everybody that's else that's competing in that race is going to want to take her down, take that team down. She's the team to beat. There's two people with the same last name that are, that are, uh, in the race. So there's a pair of siblings or something, it seems. And, um, so yeah, Yukon quest 80 and then the Yukon quest 200 in Alaska. These are this is all starting in Fairbanks. You have uh, Jody Potts, who's uh, hoping to f- qualify for the Iditarod this year, a native Alaskan woman. Uh, and then you got uh, Ashley Franklin and Abby Vandenberg. And uh, Josh McNeil was signed up for it, but he won't be running in it. Maybe he'll have his dogs in it with someone else on the runners. Um, Joanna Weber is an Iditarod veteran. I think she's actually uh, she is married and she uh, she shared on Facebook that I think she's expecting. So we got two mushers behind that dog team. Um, so getting that kid started young. And then you've got the <laughs> Conquest Alaska uh, 300. So the 80, 200, and 300. These are all starting on Saturday, downtown Fairbanks. And this is a really competitive race. You've got uh you know the competitive aspect but there's just a lot of familiar names from this season yeah not a whole lot of new ones the keaton low brick is a uh friend of my my one of my best friends cody uh waterbury's keaton and him are close and they keaton and his girlfriend maybe or wife um they started a kennel a couple years ago and so this is uh huge for them this is kind of their like first big event as a kennel, Stargazer Racing. So, uh, really excited to see how that goes for them. It's really probably huge in their world. So, uh, I'm sure they're not going to be getting trying to get first to the finish line, but maybe who knows? I don't know what their intentions are. Uh, Steve Humes, I'm not sure who that is, but he's running 300 miles across the interior of Alaska. So he's somebody. I'll tell you that much. Sydney Ball is running Vern Halter's dogs. Um, and she finished the Copper Basin 300 with her team. Uh, did well. And, uh, and, and so now she's going on another 300 mile challenge. And this race is a tough, tough trail. So is the 200. They're going up and over Rosebud and up and over Eagle Summit, the infamous, infamous climbs. And um, then the 300 continues on from circle, uh, sorry, from central to circle and then back to central, I believe. And uh, that last run for the 300, there's two 75-ish mile runs to end the 300. So the first first run, it goes to two rivers, pretty chill run. Uh, And then from two rivers, Goes to mile 101, not like super gnarly run, but it's, I think it's kind of long. And then the next two runs are short, but they're difficult. And uh, and then you got the two really long runs at the end. So, yeah, it's, it's a tough race. Uh, I've done it. And I wish everybody the best. You got Ben Good, who's an Iditarod rookie. Anna Hennessy ran uh, the Connect 200 as an Iditarod rookie. Brent Sass, we've heard of him. Roan Boozer, uh, Martin Boozer's son. Oh, that's all uh, Brent gets? That's all he gets, dude? Oh, we heard of him? Okay, all right, fair <laughs> well, enough. You know. Well, all right, fair. I think we've heard of him. You're Brent right. Sass right. is the clear head and shoulders favorite to win this race. How about that? Um, heard of him. Josie right. Thur had a really strong copper basin. Laurel Eklund was in the copper basin. So you've seen all these guys again, Deke ran the, uh, Deke had a team in the copper basin and his handlers, Jonah Bacon. And so they are having a friendly competition within this race. Yep. Um, so really cool to see. Right on. And then you got Jason Mackey, the red lantern from, uh, I did a rod last year, making his, this year's debut event. Uh, I'm not sure about Joey Saban, but he's running the 300 miles across the interior of Alaska. So he is somebody. Christy Barrington is uh, taking the Barrington uh, Iditarod team out uh, this year across the Alaska. And um, her sister ran the Copper Basin, I believe, last week. 
And so now she's taking a team out and running the uh, 300 uh, quest. And then Eddie Burke, uh, you know, he finished uh, sixth in Connect 200 and uh, has been training a little bit between then and now. And excited to see what he's able to pull off as he gets this new team of dogs that have come from a few different genetic lines, uh, different training systems and condition and, and different, um, you know, backgrounds. And he's trying to build this team up to become a competitive Iditarod team. Um, so excited to see what he pulls off. And uh, you've got Matt. Matthew Schmidt. So he is the husband of Aaron Altimus, I believe is her last name, who's an Iditarod rookie from the lower 48 in Minnesota. And so he has taken that that uh, Iditarod team out on a training run the, yeah. through this course. And then Jake Woodcock, um, he had a team finish in the Copper Basin. His team ended up having to go home early, just a little dinged up from the soft trail. So excited to see uh, what he can pull off uh, in his kind of home turf. He's uh, he lives up there in this area. A lot of these mushers live up in Fairbanks. People like Deke, Jonah, Ben Good, Brent Sass, uh, Laura Eckland, and um, a few other teams. So we'll move on to the, the Canadian side. But it's exciting, exciting weekend in Alaska and Fairbanks, and it's going to be. <laughs> hold with a capital C. Yeah, I think I saw someone's uh someone's um uh status or post on on social media and it was like showing the weather. It's like maybe we should maybe we should just cancel the race. Obviously they were joking, but um yeah, nonetheless. Uh so we got I've gone ahead and pulled up the uh the the canadian side and um you know the way they've got it listed here you can start with the 450 sean yeah there's the 450 the 250 and the 100 the 450 being the super bowl of the of the yukon's uh the yukon territories racing season and um we got a lot of strong teams a lot of curious teams going out there and, and trying out these new rules uh cody straith and the Squid Acres have two of the top four teams in the Copper Basin. And this is a similar country. It was really cold and really hilly. And uh, I certainly a favorite to finish high up in this race. And, um, you know, it starts in Whitehorse, goes to Brayburn. There's a, a couple smaller checkpoints that aren't typically in the Yukon Quest 1000, but they want to, they added an extra checkpoint and they have some hospitality stops out there. Um, but yeah, Cody's very familiar with this country and Connor McMahon as well. He lives just south of, of Whitehorse. So this is his backyard too. And he's running his rookie Iditarod. He's been working hard down there and uh, this will be kind of his last big training run, yep. so to speak, with his team before he is. Uh, Shout you out know, to Connor. kind of taking it, taking it. Uh, he's probably after this race going to just kind of keep him moving a little bit, but not have to go on another 100, 200 mile trip, I presume. Um, so, yeah, this race is, uh, is you know, so I've, I've handled and been to these checkpoints, excuse me, and they uh, are some awesome little spots, Pelly Crossing and Carmax and Brayburn and um, a really fun community of people. Uh, I love the, like the country, you know, like the quote unquote country accent of the Yukon territory. It's just you kind of, you know, you met Aaron Peck is maybe, I don't think he's from there, but he spent a lot of time there and you meet these people out there that live in the, in this real cold uh, region. It's actually White Horse is farther south, I think, than Anchorage, but it's freaking cold still because it's just just inland enough to be kind of an interior vibe. And then they're going to continue to head north from there. It's a White Horse is the southernmost part, and it goes pretty much straight north uh, and ends in Dawson City, the old gold mining town that's still got uh, some good tourism in the summer and whatnot. Um, but yeah, Connor McMahon, Atlanta Kingsley, 
Um, we got Kaylin Owens, her husband ran the Copper Basin successfully. They have rerun kennel and they have all their dogs are kind of they maybe got didn't make the teams of other kennels or are adopted. Uh literally like a hodgepodge adopted team that they kind of string together and and go and get to the finish lines of these huge events. So really like uh worth a follow seeing if you're into kind of the back half of the races, the less competitive part, these guys have an incredible story because they're pretty much a, a, a taking dogs that no one else wants to take or at the time, you know, not saying that they're, they, yeah, but they're taking dogs that maybe can't find a home and they take them and they make them gr- great and fit in with this, this team. And it's cool to see. I've talked to Kaylin for a few minutes at the copper race and she's super nice. And um, I'll be rooting for her. Uh, Mela Hill, you know, I don't know everybody, but Paige and Cody, you know, Squid Acres, they got their, both their teams in it. I didn't know that. So that's exciting. Misha ran the Copper Basin. She knows she'll be in the back of the pack, but she's just loves being out and going on adventures with her dogs. And that's what it's all about, baby. Um, Mike Parker, we, he had a great Copper Basin, really, really strong. So I'm excited to see what he's able to pull off with the Northern Whites and Jim Lanier's dogs. Um, Michelle Phillips, you know, she, she can, you know, I think she's uh, in a top three Yukon Quest finisher. Uh, she thinks she won the Canadian Quest last year, potentially. Um, so she's, she's definitely someone who's going to be finishing in the front. Uh, Jay Levy. And Shaney Traska, I've seen, uh, I've, I raced with her husband uh, in the Iditarod. Uh, they got good dogs, great, great people. Uh, Richie Beatty, this will be his uh, debut of 2024 racing season and his big event of the year. Uh, I've, I've spent some time hanging out with him and his dogs. His dogs are awesome and hilarious and rowdy and uh, mm-hmm. excited to see what he can do out there. He could be someone you see get compete in this race. Um, because he's got the dogs to do it in Norman Casavant. So exciting race over there in the Yukon territory. And, and uh, <clears throat> I'll be following. And uh, you got the 250 as well and and the 100 um, that are all starting in Whitehorse. Uh, and the 250 um, just st- stops a little shy of, of Dawson City, not going all the way there. But uh, there's only, I think they have like five mushers in that race. But um, still some really difficult country. And, 250 miles is not a short distance. And I, it, can you just quickly highlight a little bit of the differences in both of the quests, the long, longest version of the quest, both in Alaska and Canada? Um, obviously the distances aren't the same, but, uh, you know, we, and we've had Aaron Peck on where he kind of highlighted the, the, the 450, how it's, it's a total of uh, miles or 38, 38 hours. hours and it's 20 hours on uh 20 hours that are at checkpoints and the other 16 they can take anywhere 18. else they want 18 excuse me um so they can take that not at checkpoints which is kind of a unique discussion that we had with Aaron um that you know they're one of the one of the first races that are trying this out where they did it last year and they're doing it again where, you know, they can, they can add to the 38 hours of rest time, not at a checkpoint, which is very unique. So I know there's that, um, as it relates to the Alaska side with the two fifty, or excuse me, with the 300, um, what was the hours there? The mandatory uh, breakdown yeah, there was one mandatory six and one mandatory four at the checkpoints. So it's on the complete other end of the spectrum. Now it is shorter, but it's really a difficult country and there's some really long runs in there. And so it'd be interesting to see. I think that you can win this race and you, you're going to, you, you're probably going to have to take extra rest over those 10 hours. Um, and maybe someone will try to just do the minimum, but uh, the rest, the, the different, the thing is, is that with the 10 hour rest in the Cusco, and I, I mean, this is what I read. I saw that it said it's a one six hour at one checkpoint and one four hour at another. Well, the Cusco has 10 hours, but you can spread them out between 
pretty much all the checkpoints. So, uh, the I would think that there's going to be people taking much more rest, at least a few hours more rest than the ten hours, because you're going to need to stop more than twice in a in a 300 mile event like that. And I think you could potentially not add extra rest, but I really think that the faster that you probably be faster resting three hours than just going, sending it, doing basically three 100 mile runs and through that kind of country, I think, uh, isn't going to bode well. So you'll see, it'll be, it's you got one end of the spectrum in Alaska, minimal mandatory rest. And then the other end of the spectrum, we got 38 hours of mandatory rest, but it is 450 mile race. And you can take half of those hours on the trail or anywhere you want. So that's really going to be interesting to see the, like what, what we're looking at with these two different kinds of style events. Right on. Uh, anything else to conclude with on either of these races? Yeah. I mean like 300 is hilly, but I think the 450 is too, but I, I haven't been like, I haven't run those runs. You know, I don't, not super familiar with that country, but my understanding is it is pretty hilly in some of those runs and, uh, and some, some difficult country. And so yeah, they're, it's, it's, they call it a quest for a reason because you find your, what is, is a quest out there. You're, feels like a, yeah, a crazy yeah. mission. <laughs> well, good stuff. Um, that was a long intro, but there was also quite a bit to cover. And, you know, every time I, uh, I apologize for a long intro, you know, um, someone like, sends us a, a message and is like, don't apologize, you know? So, um, and the reality is I'm sure that those that aren't interested in the intro, just get to the guests. Right. Yeah, so you can fast forward, you can fast forward. It doesn't offend me. Um, uh, so yeah, let's, let's talk about our guest on this episode, Mr. Jason Severs. I believe it's Severs. Um, this was our, I would say this is the first guest that we've had on that isn't a musher. And so his, his background is a little bit different. He is a, a race marshal. He's been in a race official. He's on the board of directors for the copper basin. Um, Sean has had several run-ins with him over the years. Um, man, it was really interesting to talk to someone who is behind the scenes and is putting on a race. And, uh, you know, Sean can talk a little bit more in detail about it, but the Copper Basin is is a race that is a well-run race and the people that are involved in it um, always talk about how, how it, it's, it's a, how the experience for them is good. And a lot of that has to do with Jason's involvement with that race. And, um, he even talks like we were, we literally recorded and he was getting off with us and he was on his way to the Yukon quest Canada to, to, to marshal that race. And, uh, you know, so it was really interesting just talking to him about, maybe a different perspective than what we generally talk about with our guests. Sean, go ahead. Yeah. Jason, uh, he is a stand up guy. Uh, I mean, from the little that I know of, I mean, you know, put, putting together this race, volunteering 170 volunteers for the copper basin. Um, something that has been going on long since before Jason showed up, but you know, he seems to have made this event, a little bit more organized and steady improvements every year. Um, not to say that it wasn't you know, organized before, but he's, you can see that the love and the hard work that goes into it. And, you know, I, I, me and Brandon both grew up, you know, going to church. We, we, uh, we, you know, the community that you have at a church is a special thing. And um, he's, he's got something like that going out there in Glen Allen. And I think that, you know, he does a really good job of, using that same kind of energy of, of, of getting people together and making something happen. You know, it's a special social event and a, and it's an expedition out there in, in Glen Allen. They're putting in, you know, 250 to 280 miles, a new trail every winter just for this event. And, um, you know, it is, 
great. It's, it's just amazing to see the the quality of the human beings that are surrounding that event. Of course, the dogs too. But he's not like a dog guy. He said he grew no. up with dogs, but he's not 20, even really a dog guy. He just twenty miles or less on the, the runners community. is what he said. So yeah, twenty total miles. But he's an epic snow machiner, and but he's just like me with in the sense that he came from the dirty south, showed up to Alaska. Yep. With, uh, you know, with nothing more than your hopes and dreams and end up doing some crazy Alaska shit like uh, snow machining the Copper Basin Trail and putting it in multiple times every winter. And uh, and now he's helping out with the Quest and the Iditarod and the Willow 300 if that goes, you know. And so, yeah, uh, people like Jason, there's a, a lot of them. Uh, that well okay that's kind of a terrible thing to say i meant to say there's not many people like jason but there might actually be a, a people like donna who are his, his assistant in the copper basin she's been she's volunteering at the quest this year you know they got these amazing human beings like jason is what i'm trying to say that are out there behind the scenes volunteering their free time just to put goodness into the world and for no other reason than that, you know, and, uh, and it's, uh, we th- we're thankful for it. Absolutely. Yeah, man. Um, you know, uh, uh, we hope that you guys enjoy listening to this and getting maybe a different perspective. Um, I guess I, as, as I was thinking about what I said, our first guest that wasn't a musher was, well, I guess, Robert Forto is a musher. He's not net. He hasn't really done a race though. So like he's definitely a musher, but you know, he's not, he's not running these big Alaskan races, but he's got 35 flood dogs. So that's a good a musher point. to me. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, so yeah. So we hope that you all enjoy uh, this different perspective and, uh, this episode. And before we transition over to the, um, to the interview i did want to just mention a little bit about what sean and i've got coming up for the iditarod and so sean you know we've kind of talked a little bit about it but i wanted you to like kind of explain a little bit more of what you'll be doing during the iditarod this year um i'm gonna be uh helping out with the iditarod insider and getting uh, getting out on the to the trail, flying to a few to the different checkpoints to manage a live video feed. I will be there at the start, and I will be at. Yeah, I've got an idea of what checkpoints I'll be at. Maybe Rainy Pass and um, Elam, and somewhere in between. But I'm really excited about the opportunity. I'm really excited to see my friends moving down the trail. I'm going to see a lot of familiar faces out there and hopefully I can bring a little, um, little Underwood energy into the, and I did a ride insider and, uh, you know, definitely have a little bit of FOMO that I won't be like doing our, I won't be as available to, you know, sit, shoot the shit with Brendan and, and, uh, kind of break down the race. Um, and uh, you know but we'll see we'll see if i can get uh reach out to brandon and send him a message you know every day maybe with a little something something but a little um, something something all right all right now yeah you know hey just, now <laughs> we're gonna there'll be some cool stuff that's happening out there that you don't get to see unless you're out there so i'm excited about it i'm not real. i don't really know a lot about what i'm getting into uh, what they're asking of me, but I'll be out there and I'll be helpful. And, uh, and I'm going to have a lot of good stories, I think at the end of it, but that's not starting until, uh, March. So yeah, early March. No. And essentially, uh, for those of you who, who listened to the episode where we had Greg Heister on, you know, he kind of even hinted at it during that interview. And, and, uh, so, you know, Sean kind of followed up and, you know, I, I love that this is an opportunity that our podcast kind of created for him and dang it. I wish I lived in Alaska cause he kind of, Greg kind of made it sound like there could be even some lower level thing than that that I could do. <laughs> but, um, 
So I'm stoked for Sean, but we are going to carry on. Uh, we, me, I'm going to carry on kind of what we started last year on YouTube. And so without Sean, though, I, I can't like break down and provide analysis because I don't know. But you I'm almost, looking. I mean, I'm getting there. Bad. I'm getting there. But like, it's, I still got, you know. I got, I got, I got some more room for growth, but we're going to kind of take a page out of what we did last year and have some guests on. And so like last year, one of our most liked watched videos was when we had Sebastian Chanel on and he broke down some stuff. And I think for you and I both, that was like an eye opening interview because like we were just kind of like figuring out how to do the YouTube thing and like getting comfortable with that. And then he came along and just like shattered things with his perspective and, you know, he's done the race and all of that. And then, so we've, we've got him this year. Um, I've reached out to Christy Barrington. She's going to join us as well. Uh, Aaron Peck, Chad Stoddard, and we're working on a few others. Um, so that list is hopefully going to grow a little bit, but it'll be nice to, have some of the people that have done the race before um, be able to kind of analyze it from their perspective and and bring some depth to things that I probably won't be able to do all alone. So um, I just wanted to kind of uh, drop that little nugget and um, you know, we talk about liking and subscribing and following and all of that. I think during the Iditarod, our main focus is going to be YouTube. So, you know, just like make sure that you are locked in on us there and, and, you know, spread the word, help, help, uh, help us get more followers for that. That would be great. So Sean, I don't know if you have anything else to add before we, uh, conclude here. Peace and love, baby. Love you guys. And here's Jason. Enjoy. Yeah, feels wrong for me to do the intro, but here we go. All righty, folks. All righty, folks. Uh, how did I do? How did I do, Brennan? I think you did all right, man. All, right. all righty, folks, isn't too hard to say. Okay. Yes. No, I, I, you know, I think most people, for most of our guests, like have some following, or you can like kind of know know a little bit about them going into it. You know, I don't know. Maybe Jason's got like this huge like fan page that I haven't found yet, but. Um, <laughs> No, but Jason's been, you know, behind the scenes in the uh, the mushing world up here in Alaska and not so behind the scenes, too. I mean, um, and I have met him running the Copper Basin in, uh, six years ago. It's yeah. kind of crazy. And I've seen him at the at the Yukon Quest a couple times and at that Diderot start. And he's always been someone really um, enjoyable to, to talk, talk with and. And it's just, lo I love hearing a good Southern accent. I don't get to hear him that much, you know, Brendan and I, you know, love it, baby. he's still down there, but it's oh, nice I love to, it. You know, our parents were from New York, so I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't it's gone. I, I say y'all sometimes, but you know, I'm, pr I'm proud that you wear that Southern accent with pride, Jason, but welcome to the show. And this is my brother, uh, Brendan, by the way. Nice to meet you. Good. <laughs> I appreciate it guys for the opportunity to be on the uh, podcast. I I've enjoyed listening to it over the last couple or last year for sure. And uh, it's it's been awesome to uh, to keep up with it and to keep up with the mushing scene. I don't have dogs and I don't run dogs, but it's been good to be able to have a podcast to be able to keep up with what's going on in the mushing world. And I am like, why, why don't you? Because I I've, I have a pretty good idea of of your you know mushing resume, whether it, even though it might not be on the runners and behind a dog team. Like what what is what your involvement with the mushing world for people who are just maybe uh, meeting you for the first time right now. Oh, so, um, moved to Alaska in 2010. I don't know if you want the whole life story. Yeah, but, actually, uh, yeah, why not? No. Cause Let's you're from it. North Carolina. So, yeah. So moved to North or moved from uh, Virginia, Southwest Virginia in 2010 to Glen Allen and, um, came up here to pastor a church here in the Glen Allen Copper River Basin area. And, once I did that, my wife one night said she wanted to go out and watch these dog teams go by because they were doing the Copper Basin the first winter we got here. Or, you know, they've been doing it for 35 years. And so it was the year 2011. And we, she went out and she, she goes, she came back in all excited on a Saturday night. Hey, I saw their headlamps. They were in the ditch. They, it was so awesome. The next morning we were driving into Glen Allen to go to church. And on the way in, I saw like 40 teams 
didn't see headlamps. I saw actual dog teams going from Chistachina back into Glen Allen. And so I didn't get to see a headlamp. I got to see the whole thing. I told her, I said, if you just waited a couple hours, you would got to see actual mushers and actual dog teams. And so 2011 uh, was, was the year, first year here of seeing the Copper Basin. 2012 was the year that the race canceled up between Myers Lake and Sourdough. And after that, the board uh, pretty much um, was down, we whittled down to one person. So there was an open meeting within the community here in Glen Allen. And I got uh, voluntold, not really, but I got uh, drafted to help out with the race. And so I've been on the board since 2013. And I do have about uh, about 20 miles on runners. It's about all I've got. But uh, my my runners are the runners running boards on a snow machine to put in the trail. So that's where I that's where I have uh, I ride. Right on. And that and the Copper Basin is Brendan. You know, uh, I think. I mean, Jason, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot some of the trail is is put in specifically for this event. And, yeah. you know, whereas like maybe a lot of some other races, there's just kind of already trails like uh, Qu the quest, for example, there's already a trail, you know, certainly leaving Fairbanks, there's a network of them in two rivers and whatnot. Um, but yeah, how much like new trail are y'all putting in for the Copper Basin most years? So, spe so specifically just for the race every year, uh, there's only a section of probably 20 miles that's actually put in by trappers. Uh, the rest of it. We put in, we start right after Thanksgiving in, no, in November, and we start putting the base down and uh, start getting the trail laid out from Thanksgiving up until the uh, the night before the race. All right. Now, let me let me uh, sneak in here. You, you're talking about trappers. All right. This is this is the guy who doesn't live in Alaska. Talk to me about trappers for a second. So there's a. Uh, there's a uh, one or there's a couple of trappers that use part of the Copper Basin Trail uh, for their trap lines, and you know they're trapping lynx, they're trapping wolves, they're trapping foxes, any coyotes, whatever they can, you know, whatever they can get. And um, there's a couple of them that we we contact weekly. He'll tell me about the section of trail that he's on, and and I'll tell him, hey, we're going to be riding that section here uh, next week. We'll check out your traps, make sure that you know nothing's broke, nothing's needs fixed. Fixing and he does, we'll stop and fix it for him and and uh, just try to help try to help each other out. Nice. <clears throat> and they're like for the like the trapping is you know the wolf wolves and lynx they have great fur for warm gear and right. yeah and certainly there's you know you know if, if you're uh, listening and you have never really been to Alaska or only visited a little bit, bit here and there you know trapping and hunting and fishing in Alaska is really well managed um and arguably you know the best in the world as far as just this the bounty of it all and and how much there is available but it's also really well managed by fishing game and you know they're managing how many predators and prey and, right. and of each animal are in each area and it's just, just totally unique to alaska i mean yes you can hunt in the lower 48 but it's just a different scene instead of um and things you're dealing with people are using private property there's you know here we got all this public land and so um and most of it isn't there's no people you know there's the, i think we have the fewest roads in alaska of any state and it's the biggest state you know so it's just there's so much uh country you can go and explore that isn't like there's no people right yeah. um I was just going to say the miles that we, you know, the miles that we travel between checkpoints, you know, I think from Chistachina back over into Myers Lake, that's 65 miles, you know, and you pass no cabins, you pass no houses besides the house, the, the one cabin that's up there about 25 miles out of Chistachina is, is the uh, only cabin that you'll pass in those 65 miles. Wow. And the, it was so cool getting to go to the copper brand. And I wish, I wish you could have seen it, man. Cause it's just like, it is, it is considered to be, I, I don't know. I just think that every, everybody really has nothing bad to say about the copper base. And it's just such a, uh, I think the the only bad thing is that sometimes it's really freaking cold. Um, this yeah, year, fortunately, <laughs> fortunately it wasn't, but. Yeah. I remember a couple of years ago that, uh, you know, I have a picture on my phone, uh, temperature was 62 below zero in sourdough. And I remember uh, one of the mushers came in and, and she said, it's not 60 below zero. It's got to be 80 below zero. 
And uh, yeah, it has has a tendency to get cold out here. <laughs> yep. I think they're calling. I think they're calling for fifty blows this week. Wow. Yeah, we got about a foot of snow here in Anchorage. I was wondering. I was I was about to text you, but I figured I'd ask you here. You know, has you guys get a, like a reprieve from the cold weather snap we're in the, yesterday, or is it just still? Well, the last couple of week or the last couple of days from Friday until today, we had twenty eight inches of snow. Damn. And, and it was snowing at twenty below on Friday. That's so crazy to have the twenty below yeah. snow. Like, yeah. I, I just you don't see that. You don't see that. No, it, so it's I, typically I, yeah it's typically warm and snowy and cold and and clear yeah i've plowed the house uh three times over the weekend wow so you so you do you run the copper uh you know your your i guess the trail is kind of your entire like what is your role within the copper basin you know you're getting so, putting the trail in so my role is i'm the board president been the board board president for the last uh since 2016 i believe so I'm the board president. I'm also the race manager. And up the last couple of years, the trail ball. So the race manager pretty much makes sure straws are at, straws at all the checkpoints. Trash bags are all the checkpoints. Uh, road crossings are taken care of. Um, make sure that gas is for, you know, there for the snow machines that are going, the uh, trail crew that's out in front of the racers. And then take care of all the cleanup after the race. And then the trail ball says, I just make sure sure that you guys are mushing the mushers have a good trail to go on and and that that was not my original role the original uh jamie kemp i think he was trail boss when sean you ran the race um jamie kemp was was one of our trail crew and he passed away uh in before the 2018 race and then um, we lost tim taylor one other one of our trail crew last year right after the copper basin so uh it's kind of whittles on you for a little bit but no we've had a we've had a, a pretty good run of making sure the trail's good let's say yeah, i we're sorry to hear about i've i've never met these guys but i you know i saw um every everyone mourning and and uh like some unexpected passings um and and i think like that you know give gave me a glimpse into the, the community that surrounds well mushing in general but specifically like the copper basin and like the quest, you know, I think they both have this really uh, specially. I think every every race has their own yeah, kind of community do. around it, certainly. But yeah, they, yeah it was just uh, you can. There's just, everybody's just so welcoming, and Glen Allen, and uh, you know, all the volunteers and race officials. We like were super nice, and and the the trail mark. Like I remember. Because like I'm not, you know, Lewis and Clark out there, man. Like it's, you know, you think that we're navigating out the Copper Basin or the Iditarod. Like the trail is like marked. It's idiot proof. Like it, you have just markers everywhere. You're like, I wonder why is there so many markers coming up? There must be like I should probably pay attention. Then sure enough, there's like a 120 degree turn or something. Yeah. And you know, it's just everything is very well marked and. uh and it's just like, you know, the cohesion of the race, you know, it just seems like everything flows pretty well um, from checkpoint to checkpoint. And and then you got all the handlers, you know, out there driving from from one checkpoint to another. The road crossings, Brendan, like I didn't ever mention that to you, but like these are crossing like highways where like semis are ripping down the road at 70 miles an hour and they put out like huge flashing lights. And like, you know, if you're on the road, you you're see you see it from a mile away and you know to slow down because there could be a dog team crossing and you know so there's just so many things that are going in to these events and i guess you're kind of jason the glue that is br like connecting the you know all these different you know sections of the event uh, that you know making sure it all kind of goes well yeah we have we have a great board uh the board that we've had now has been intact for several years and Everybody does their role, and it's, we were talking about it this year. It's amazing how up to like two weeks prior to the race, everybody feels like you're scrambling. You feel like you have – everything's falling apart and nothing's going <laughs> together. And all of a sudden, the night before the race, you're like, how's this going? And how's this – oh, yeah, that's fine. That's done. The, the light towers are at the road crossings, and the signage is at the road crossings, and we got people there. And, and uh, oh, by the way, the, the river's frozen. You get across the river this year. and you don't have to cross the bridge. And so those are the things that you 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 deal with up until 
uh, the week of the race. And then it just seems like it all falls together every year. That's awesome. I was curious how, how many people are on the board? So there is seven people on our board. Um, we have our treasurer secretary that takes care of all of our permitting with BLM and Otna, which is the native corporation. Um, she also contacts all the trucking companies to make sure that the road crossings, you know, that they know that we're crossing the highway. Um, then I have, we have a merchandise person. We have, uh, Donna is our vice president. Um, we have media, uh, Carolina does a great job with our media every year. We have a volunteer coordinator. Uh, we have, I think we estimated we have over 170 uh, volunteers that help put on the race every year. Wow. Um, wow. And not all of those are from the Glen Allen Copper Basin area. A lot of those or some of those come from Anchorage. Uh, some of those come from out of state. Our vet team comes in. You know, I think this year our head vet brought in, she had 13 veterinarians and five of those were from outside uh, down in the lower 48. So, uh, you know, when you're talking about putting together any race, whether it be the Cusco or the uh, Copper Basin or the Willow or, you know, the Connect, there, it, it takes a whole army of people. And there's a, there's a few people sitting on the board, but if the race don't happen, if you don't have all those volunteers out there to uh, make sure the race goes. Yeah, that, that's actually what my next question was, was talk talking to me about or talking to us about the volunteers. So 170, is that like, is that an average number? uh for a race or like if like let's say you didn't get a hundred and you or you only got a hundred like are you still able to put the race on with only that many or oh you i think you could put the race on it would be it'd be rough because you as board members we'd be scrambling to find somebody to fill a role and if they couldn't find somebody we'd have to go fill the role so i think uh, i think you could do a race with a hundred other races do it but when we're talking about 170 volunteers, you know, you've got checkpoint leaders and they've got their crew. So they've got five, seven, eight, ten people that work in each checkpoint. And then you got a trail crew that's out prior to the race. You have a trail crew that's out just before the dog team. And then you have a cleanup crew out after, you know. So to say that you have 170 volunteers, everybody has their role and plays their role rather well. If they're if they're missing, that means somebody else has got to pick up. It's like basketball, next man up, you know? Right. Yeah, I mean, like the checkpoints, Brennan, you know, most of them are lodges, and people, yeah. the vo lodges are like, they're running like an all-nighter shift. Like, they're, like, you can see it in their eyes by the time, <laughs> by the time the last teams are rolling in. They're like, do you want, do what, do what you want, a coffee? What do you, I need a coffee, <laughs> you know, and they're just, and it's it's well, tough. Uh, so and, most of the time, they just put the coffee pot out there on the counter and say, get your, help yourself for your coffee. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so, and, so the Copper yeah. Basin started as a as a lodge race. It started going from lodge to lodge for the lodges out here in the basin in the 1990s, early or 19, 1989, 1990. And that's what the purpose of it was to bring people into the region to go to these lodges and to uh, help finance you know, their winners. Yeah. There's no activity out here outside of uh, some ice fishing and some basketball tournaments during the winter. So I'm curious, I've always kind of been curious, but we never really had the right guest on to ask. So specifically with the Copper Basin, you know, you said that you're grooming the trail for months leading up to the event. And then during the event, you also have the trail breakers that we oftentimes see on the GPS. We're like, oh, who's this in first place? Trail breaker? What? Um, yeah, TB so, keeps on crushing every what race. The heck, for some man? Reason. <laughs> So 30 just, miles an hour down a the pipeline. They're, they're killing it. I need to get some of those dogs. So I'm, I'm just kind of curious. Uh, I mean, I, I think I know the answer that, you know, you're just kind of like going through and making sure the trail is still safe to navigate, but just talk a little bit more about what the trail breakers are doing, especially like in, in with the copper basin where it's already kind of been groomed leading up to the race. So, um, Sean, I don't remember if it was 2018, 2019. You can probably help me with this, but we got a foot of snow the start of the race. I tell you what, 2018, it snowed three feet that weekend. I know <laughs> yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. So the trail breakers, you know, you've got a base down, but the trail breakers are out there looking for stakes that have been knocked down, any open water. Like this year, they crossed uh, 
So I sent my two, two of my boys up to the Gacona River up at Paxson, and they crossed it on Saturday morning and said it was fine. By Saturday night, there were three open channels of water that uh, you saw on our Facebook page. Uh, the teams had to cross, and some of it was eight to 10 feet wide, you know, 10 to 10 inches to a foot deep that opened up just during the day that the trail crews had to go, you know, they went in there and tried to mark around it, find spots around it. So they're looking for trail markers are down, any danger that is on the trail. Um, and that's the reason you have the trail breakers out there. Number one, make sure that there is still a trail there in case there's snow or drifting or anything like that. And then just make sure there's no safety concerns on the trail. Nice. 300 miles, you know, it's like, it's a lot, it's a lot to, a lot to, uh, it's like, they probably, most of the trail is probably fine, you know, and they're yeah. just like these couple spots that you gotta, well, you only know if it's going to be at that spot, if you're get out there and look. So you, well, you what know. we don't want to have, have happen is what happened in 2012 when the race got canceled because the trail got blown in or whatever happened there. And, the, you know, all the teams were camping out on a 12 mile Creek yeah, just outside of Myers Lake. And uh, they could not get snow machines up the mountain because there was so much snow blown in and covered the trail. And so, yeah, we just have, uh, we, we put trail crews out there now, trail breakers, and every race does it. A lot of the races, and I shouldn't say a lot of the races, um, uh, some of these races, they're running out, doing a loop, and then coming back. I think that's what the Cusco does. And, right. uh, you know, ours is, ours is just a 300-mile loop. And so you, they're not, they're going out, but they're not coming back the same way they went out. Right. Hmm. So this year we get a nice, nice temperatures of perfect dog running temperatures. It was still like a really tough race, but I think, you know, I don't know if you pick there's, you're never going to get in and out of the copper basin without some kind of adversity, uh, whether it's warm or cold temperatures or, soft trail or whatever it is. And so now you, you've got that behind you. January is almost over. You can almost taste spring, but not quite. And not with 50 below this week coming up, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. 50 below is coming up. What in a couple of days for you. Yeah, That's I why think. I moved to Anchorage and, uh, <laughs> where it's, it's, uh, actually supposed to get down to 20 below one of these days, which is wow. like, I don't know if that's happened in many years in Anchorage. Um, so it's funny because people are like, yeah, I remember when the winters were reliable here in Anchorage and da, 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 da. And I'm like, and now it's like going to get 20 below. And I know I'm going to hear all the complaining about how it's got, well, this is, there you go. You got your good winter, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you, now you're going to the quest. So what do you do for the quest? So uh, this year I am, the, uh, I'm going over to be the race marshal for the Canadian side this year. Nice. Yeah, studying so, up uh, on those on, on those rules are 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 unique, certainly. Yeah, uh, that's uh, I've got a notebook. I've got the 100 uh, mile race in its own section. I've got a two, the 250 in its own section, and I've got the 450. You know, all the rules laid out. I've got uh, everything's different about each rule, or you know, each pack, each race uh, marked. And trying to do some reading while I'm heading over there tomorrow. Sitting sitting in the back of the truck, and as somebody drives. I'll be reading the rule book, but I've, I've been reading it, you know, just trying to make sure I'm familiar with it. I, I'm interested to see how the rest works, you know, yeah. through, cause they're requiring rest. Uh, they're allowing rest on the trail. So I'm interested in how that's going to work out. Yeah. That's this. They did it. Did they do it last year? Yeah, they did it last year. Yeah. I think it was the first year they've allowed it rest on the trail. So, but um, you were doing the Alaskan quest last year. No, I didn't do, I haven't done the Alaskan. I haven't done quest at all since 2020 since the um, last thousand since, yeah, yeah since the last thousand i did the uh i did the 300 i was a marshal for the 300 last in 2020 okay and and and, go ahead. and so i'm going to uh it'll be interesting to see how that works out just that that short period of uh or those 38 hours of rest on the trail themselves yeah <clears throat> we had uh aaron peck on and he was kind of highlighting that um, some of the differences in the quest and super interesting, you know, I guess the debate of more rest and, or less rest and how the dogs look and what that will do for them or not do for them. Um, so yeah, very, 
just very interested to see if that's something that continues to grow into other races. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. with you going out there and, and, and seeing it for firsthand for the first time, you know, is there an element of maybe thinking about, well, how can we bring this to the basin? Yeah, I don't know that uh, that's something that we would we would bring to the basin, um, but just because of the, the distance, you know, it's 300 miles. Um, I think, and Sean can correct me if, he, if I'm wrong, but I think that the way we have the rules set up in other, other, other 300 mile races have the rules set up where, you know, you're required to do a six hour layover at one checkpoint. Uh, I think it's, it's good that they're doing rest in the checkpoints. Um, for me personally, I like it. It, it keeps kind of helps out with some of the math and some of the logistics of it all. So I don't know. I don't know that we're going to bring it to the Copper Basin, but some other 300 mile race may try it and and it may succeed. I, I would be interested to see what it does. How it does yeah, it. it's still it's certainly still in the the like infancy R and D yeah. and phase, yeah. Yeah. infancy stages. And uh, and you know, 18 hours at the Copper Basin at, between the checkpoints for especially if, like for a well trained competitive team, it's like it's plenty of rest. And you know, you saw a lot of these teams actually still be competitive and take breaks out on the trail yeah. too which yeah. was super neat uh and you know because you do have a couple of really just it's the 68 mile run but even that 55 in the Luis this year was you know it was not certainly wasn't a six hour run for really any team so um no, no. and it almost never is so you know yeah you can take you can still get those trail rests in and you're probably not going to win but you're you could certainly um, you know, sneak into the top 10 and, and maybe in a weird year. Yeah. You could be in the money. Yeah. Um, and it's like, I, I guess I'm curious, like, <clears throat> like clearly you're pretty good at this. You, you have races that are asking you to join, um, you know, and yet you have like, maybe not the most profound understanding of like mushing because you've done 20 miles on a sled, as you just said, you know, um, like, but then you're, you know, you're a pastor of a church in Glen Allen, you know, you, you got it. You, so community is a huge part of what you're doing. Like you're, I, I didn't know that you're a volunteer fire in the fire department there at Glen Allen. Is that right? I am. Yes. So it's like, yeah. you're just a community guy. So it's like, you know, um, I guess what is is that when when people are looking at Jason like we need to get him here for this race is it they're thinking like this guy is just gonna uh, like what 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 do you think that you're bringing to the table it's clearly like it's working whatever it is you know well I I think that you uh, you talk about community stuff I, in the Copper Basin I grew up in in North Carolina rural North Carolina Western North Carolina where I mean community did everything if there was any you know. If it was a, a football game, the community was there to support the football team. If it was a, it didn't matter what it was, the 4th of July parade, it was a big community event. And there were people volunteering to do things. That, and so I grew up in that, with that mindset of just, it's my community. What can I do to help? How can I be, uh, how can I encourage people? How can I help people? And um, so that's, when I came to Glen Allen in 2010, that was my mindset. Yeah, I came here to pastor a church and that's my primary goal. And that's my primary job as pastor in a church, but um, you re you soon realize that somebody needs to help with the dog race because it's not going to happen unless um, somebody's going to help out. And the local fire department, the same thing. Volunteerism has been always been big in my family. My parents trained me, taught me that when I was a kid growing up in Western North Carolina. And so um, I just enjoy being outside. I enjoy being um, involved. I would hate to live in Glen Allen and not be involved. In yeah. <laughs> yeah. To do your... <laughs> That's a good point. It's like, yeah, you know, that, that is you a special to... thing about those small towns here in Alaska and anywhere. Yeah, You, you got to get out and you got to get out and do something. I mean, I tell my, my wife and, and I have this conversation often. She said, you know, if we ever moved anywhere else, it'd probably kill me because I'd be stuck not being able to do anything. You just got to get out. You got to get out and get involved in. And as far as going to these other races, uh, yeah. I can booty a dog and I can put a, a harness on a dog and hook it to the lead line and, and get, get the sled going. But, uh, being a race, race official is not that hard. You can read, if you can read a rule book and, and, uh, execute some, 
some rules, I think you're you can, anybody can do it. But I, I just appreciate the opportunity to get to go see some parts of the world that you don't get to go. Uh, my first quest that I got to help on help out with, I went to Slavin's Roadhouse, mm. and man, that's that's as remote as you can get. Slavin's. Yeah, explain Slavin's for uh, people oh. who might not know. I mean, I've never been there because I handle for the quest, but you can't get there. Yeah, yeah. So Sla- Slavin's is an old. Um, Slavin's is an old. Sorry, guys. You're good. Um, Slavin's is, is an old trapper's roadhouse on the Yukon River that they fly you in. They fly you out uh, as a race official, and you get there, and um, <clears throat> you're there trying to help. Uh, it's basically a dog drop, a safety checkpoint. It's not an actual checkpoint, but they have a vet there, and they have a race official in case something happens, and you're there trying to uh, just doing the, doing the job. and. The first year I went, or the year I went to Slavens, it was 80 below with wind chill. I was like, I, this redneck from North Carolina is really <laughs> out of place. Man, that is insane. Yeah, it's, uh, we had some crazy wind chills, it seemed like, down in the Bethel and Antioch area. But yeah, 80, 80 below wind chill, I'm assuming it was probably 40-something ambient. Yeah. And then it yeah. doesn't take much. Wind, but what if it's blowing 15 miles an hour? That's probably now you're looking at 60, 70 below. Yeah, yeah. So, y'all, did y'all get this ambient uh wind chill thing figured out? The, <laughs> no, I still have no <laughs> idea, dude. I'm no the one idea. trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, okay. all right. I, I think I have podcast. an idea of it though. <laughs> oh, I yo, you to listened the podcast to that. That, last, that dropped lit last night, and I was like. <laughs> Yeah, these guys are struggling or somebody's struggling with ambient yeah, temperature and wind the... <laughs> Well, I mean, do you know? Oh, I know if the thermometer says it's 60 below zero, that's what the temperature is. And you talked about the real feel. I don't care what it feels like. It's 60 below. It's 60 below. But with a wind chill, I, that's, you get your real feel in the wind chill. Those are, those are the, pretty much the same thing as far as I, uh, I know. Right. Yeah. yeah the, uh, I don't know. People say for some reason, People in a, in in these cold areas are obsessed with the number forty below. You know, you just hear that oh, it's forty below, but it's like it is like the Fahrenheit and Celsius. That's when they're equal. Don't yeah. you know? And uh, and yeah, I mean, once you get from forty below to sixty below, there's definitely it's a cold. difference. I don't know. There's definitely a difference. People are like, yeah. uh, once it's below forty, it's just like, well, yeah, I've been out at near sixty below and. It certainly felt colder than forty below. I'm I'm gonna say it, you know. And, well, I, uh, I dropped into uh, I dropped into the Upper Colcana River, putting in trail this year, and it was twenty below at at uh, Myers Lake. You know, we're we're riding machines. I don't have my mask on. I just got my fur. We're riding, putting in the trail, and I dropped into that valley there, going into Sourdough, and it was like, it just felt like it dropped twenty degrees, in just a couple miles. We hit the river and it's like, we're out of here. We're going on because it's too cold down here. Let's get out of here. Cause so at cold weather, just a cold air just lays in those valleys. It don't matter where you are. Um it's it's just it's crazy cold in some of these valleys up here. Yeah, the the I did a ride run in twenty twenty one, like to the checkpoint. It's very it's just rolling hills. And so just always it was just oh, by the dozens, you'd get yeah. down to the bottom of this hill. And you'd be like, holy hell, this is 50 <laughs> below. And then you get up to the top and you're like, wow, this is like almost hot. You know, like at yeah. 20 below after 50 something feels pretty warm. And then yeah, I was, you drop back down. It's just this. I was like, what is going on? If I knew it, but it's still just kind of psychologically weird. Yeah. I, I look forward to when you get up on the hills and up on the mountains out here because it's like, you know, the warm air is rising and the cold air is sinking. So. If you can get up on top of the hills, you're going to be a little bit warmer than you are down in the down in the rivers. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of, well, two things. First of all, your town that you grew up in sounds like um, I was reminiscing. So after I graduated high school, like a couple years after that, our football team, uh, we went to not to the finals, the semifinals. And it was down in a small town, kind of like what you were describing. And I went down there to, cause I was still very much knew a lot of people on the team and whatnot. And I went down there. I'm like, all right, well, we got to get some food before we go to the game. And everywhere we went, there was a sign on the out, 
we're at the football game closed until the football game's over. Is, is that kind of like the community that you grew up in, in North Carolina, where it's like, Oh, it, whatever the big event is, that's where everyone is kind of thing. That's it. Yep. That's it. This town I grew up in had one flashing red light. It wasn't even all the way on. It was just a flashing red light at a four way stop. Our gas station was also our bank. It was our post office. Uh, you did everything at one little grocery store, one little gas station sitting on the side of the of the highway. And and if it was a basketball game, it didn't matter who it was. Everybody was at the basketball game. Yep. And uh, baseball game, community softball league, everybody was there. The whole town was was wherever the activity was. So nice. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to circle back around was, <clears throat> so you were talking about your involvement with the quest. You were last uh, there for the 2020, you said, and I'm, I'm just kind of curious, like that was the last 1000 mile version of the race. Um, like, can you, can uh, obviously Kobe, and he was doing the 300 by the way, but he, but it was the last thousand years is my understanding. Yeah. 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 I, I was just there. Uh, so I went from Fairbanks to, uh, and Sur- I ran that 2020 300, by the way. Yeah, I, you did. I, I remember it's so for, I was just like, I just realized that now I was like, yeah, cause we did the, uh, we did the banquet there it's in central. Nice. That's, we, oh, we, okay. Yeah. 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 That, that, I just remember that, uh, double down on the uh, double and down on, on, on Birch Creek was, Oh, Birch was, Creek is. I mean, I can you know, yeah, I, I, I've cried like a little baby <laughs> at the end of that race. <laughs> there's certain, there's certain trails I hear horror stories about, and there's a reason I'm not a dog musher. And that's because of certain trails that are out there like Birch Creek. And uh, some of these other trails that I hear horror stories about, it's like, yeah, it wasn't no, even know. like, it wasn't, it was a great trail. I don't know why it was so difficult in my brain, rough. but it was it's just back and forth. It just loops back and forth. Yeah. You see yourself passing your, you see yourself passing your lead dogs all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Oh, uh, sorry, Brennan. We no, got distracted, no, but fine. yeah. 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 So, I mean, I- <laughs> Ultimately, what I'm getting at is, I mean, COVID didn't help with breaking up the thousand mile version of the quest. Um, but, you know, like, I'm just kind of curious because you're on the board of the basin. Like, what might it take to get both sides of Alaska and Canada back together? Is it mean Jason needs to be on oh, the dude, board for the quest? Engage 1, Jason mode. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, that's... That's the uh, that's the question a lot of people have asked. How can you get the the Yukon side and the uh, and the Alaska side to come back together? And to be honest with you, I've been away from the Quest for the last three years. This is four years, so this is the first time yeah. I'm back. And you know, you I don't know I don't know what it would take. I'd love to see the thousand mile race come back. I enjoy it. that was that was um that's the highlight of my year is going a thousand miles from Fairbanks to Whitehorse or from Whitehorse to Fairbanks. I enjoyed that just because. You're going to so many different remote communities and remote places, and uh, did you snow I, machine that trail? No, I did not. I, I they I was there as a judge, and they flew me, you know, to where I needed to go, or they gave me a vehicle to drive. Mm-hmm. Ah, man, I'd love to snow machine. Have you? Uh, have you? Well, you ran the Iditarod, of course, but uh, I'd love to do the snow machine trip from Anchorage to Nome. That would be awesome. Yeah, I know my my, uh, my buddy Alex was. He's like. Yeah, I saw Alex last year. Oh, nice. Yeah, he he uh, he got to do the trail sweep last year, and Pete Rodano, he's uh, Anya Anya, who's an Iditarod veteran, his husband has been doing the uh, the trail sweep for a number of years, and it just sounds super fun. But there, you know, but like you see these like independent trips on the um, on the trail, you know, like yeah. people do like they call, they usually typically would call it you know the serum run if it is involving dog teams and self supported, right. So, you, you know, you're going to the serum, that is the serum run, I guess, from like the train tracks, Nina to Nome, or, you know, I guess Anchorage isn't really technically the serum run or whatever, but my point is, you know, you speak, you can do these tri- trips independently. It costs some money, but people like you could in theory, like buy a new snow machine and rip it to new Nome and then sell it there. And like, maybe it won't be that as expensive. Like maybe you still lose money. Yeah. Maybe you don't, <laughs> but maybe you could just buy the snow machine. We, 
you know, me and you, we we do it would be we'll be a dynamic duo. We'll invite all our friends, like three other friends, maybe at the most. Yeah. Yeah. We go, we rip down the whole trail, and then we're like, hey, you know, can you guys buy the snow machine for 30 grand, please? Yeah. So two <laughs> uh, two of my machines actually have been to Nome twice and back. Damn. And they've been and they've been from Fairbanks to Whitehorse and back. So uh and they're my, still my chugging along, huh? Oh yeah. One of them's got fourteen thousand miles and one of them's got eleven thousand miles. What's like what's like, you know, for a car, people say three hundred thousand miles is like the car's dead typically. Maybe even two hundred. What what is like an equivalent for a snow machine to you? Like Oh, I've seen I was I'm on some of the Facebook pages and there's there's guys that got fifty thousand kilometers over in Canada on on uh, some of these these machine four stroke machines and thirty thousand miles, I believe. Thirty thousand miles, yeah. What I, I Damn. I'd hate to know I had to sit on that machine for thirty thousand miles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How, that. how long does how if you were to go out just like let's just talk about the copper basin. If you were to go out and groom that trail right now. How long would 300 miles take you to groom? Oh, so depends. 300 miles, it depends on snow. Like right now, it would take you days because of the amount of snow we just got this weekend. Um, and then you got to factor in the temperatures. If, if it's going to be 40 and 50 below this weekend, uh, you know, it's going to take you a while to get through some of these places and get, get the trailing. I would say on a good day, um, you well, our trail breakers rode the trail. They started Saturday morning. They got back Monday morning. So that's what the trail breaker. But they're you know they're just riding already a groomed trail, marking stakes, putting fixing things that may need to be fixed. So you can do it in two days, two solid or three solid days. You could do it. Um, I know you know for my my personal machine, it I put in I put on about a uh, thousand to fifteen hundred miles per year. Just grooming trail, putting trail down for the race. Wow. Damn. Yeah, see, I, I, uh, I don't know. I'm curious. Maybe you – do you follow the uh, Iron Dog in any way? Do you, like, check that out? I follow it because I've got friends that will ride it, ride in it in the, in the expedition class or not in the racing class. They're just in the – you know, they pay the entry fee and they run out there. But I'm not a big fo- – I don't follow the Iron Dog uh, most of the time because it's going to take place when I'm – on some other race or doing something else. Right. Yeah. The, uh, my understanding was like, if you see, uh, like a, a snow machine, that's like a really good price and it only has a thousand miles or 1200 miles on it. Don't buy it. But yeah. <laughs> that's what I've been told. <laughs> don't buy it. Cause it was the iron dog yeah. and they ride those things. Some of those guys, I mean, they're right. They're running those, those machines, 150, 120, 150 miles an hour. Uh, yeah, that's what I've been told. I don't know. That's I, crazy. I, I have a hard enough time staying on one at 30 miles an hour. So. I know 30 is fast, man. You yeah. know, yeah, 100. It got to be, I feel like it has to be on like powder on a lake or something. It's got to be across some of these ice, you know, ice roads or some of this, uh, some of these big lakes out there. Yeah, that's crazy. And so, just to kind of circle back to grooming the trail, Sean and I have talked about this before uh you know like you just kind of put like a piece of fence behind your your snow machine and 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 go that way like what does it look like for what you all do for the race so it's it's actually it's uh it's evolved quite a bit um started off when i got first got involved in the race jamie kemp was he was pulling a a big old tractor tire a big old 18 wheeler tire behind his sled and um I mean, that thing would wrap around a tree and it'd throw you over the handlebars. And so he did that for some years and it just got too much. And so then we went from pulling, you know, these plastic, black plastic sleds that, that you can throw a bunch of gear in and, and mushers started complaining. And I understand because they were leaving ruts or tracks in it that uh, the runners were getting called in. And I got you, I understand that. And so they asked if we could go to a, to a Northern Sled Works or Sligland Sled. So the uh, UHMW type sleds, and we went to those. And those are like the like flatter bottoms with like yep, the one yep. fin in, in the middle, like yep. the green ones. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's what yep. we. So we pull those. We'll fill those with uh, stakes, and we'll fill those with you know gear. The trail breakers will, and then they'll pull that out there, and it leaves a nice flat trail. Um, but the race, like 
racing ball, a couple of groomers that we pull behind some of the wider sections of the trail uh, out toward uh, Lake Louise, the Lake Louise Wolf Pack, the Snow Machine Club out there. They'll put their big piston bully from Lake Louise out to Crosswinds Lake. They'll do 25 miles for us, and then they'll come back and they'll do another 25 miles to Tulsana Lake. And this is a, you know, a 12 foot wide trail, corduroy perfect. It looks like uh. it's a Nordic ski trail out there. And those, you know, Nord- the Wolf Pack has helped us out with that. And so most of the time. It's whatever you can pull behind you, whatever you can get to lay down a good flat surface and then let it set overnight and it'll harden up pretty good. Nice. I think most of the time when we go out, we're taking out the least I'd go out with is, is three machines because you, you want enough machines on it to pack the snow down, get a good base, get a good solid uh, base down. And so the least we go out with is three machines for the simple reason of if something happens, you break down, you at least have somebody to help get you back. And um, and then you're putting you're trying to get a good base down, widen the widen the trail out as wide as you can get, so these teams have enough room to pass and, and even get off the trail a little bit to bed down and to rest. <clears throat> yeah, the nuances of of grooming. I I remember like seeing Jeff with uh, the the fence or whatever behind his sled, which like like with grooming, like it just like conditions. And with anything, I mean, conditions are huge. So it's like, I didn't know that. And I would, I would like get on the snow machine. Oh, I'm going to drag this fence behind and it had just like snowed. And I'm like, well, it needs to get groomed, you know? And it just snowed. You could, I like literally made yeah. it like a quarter mile or whatever. And I was like, okay, I'm going to leave this fence here for a while. <laughs> so we, we had to do that this year. Uh, we were pulling our groomer and we're trying to go from Myers Lake over to Sourdough and we were pulling this groomer. and We ain't even got across the lake. I was like, all right, we're leaving this thing here. We're just going to go straight with some sleds because uh, if you're if you're pulling a groomer across fresh snow, you're going to be stuck more than you're going anywhere. So that's, yeah. I mean, coming from North Carolina, Sean, I had a lot to learn uh, about how to how to do any. I had a lot to learn even how to ride a snow machine. Man, I didn't have no clue. So I learned quite a bit in my last 14 years out here in the basement helping with the copper basin it's as it, but it's like that's what i'm saying you know it's like it's just so cool you come up from the, the dirty south you know and i come i come up from the what i'm a fraud because i'm from atlanta and it's not really the from dirty Hotland. south but Hotland, that's it yeah Hotland, you know and then we come <laughs> up here and you know i imagine we had a similar, you know, trajectory in our, you show up like just totally overwhelmed by, okay, am I, is this like, what are we doing here? It's, it's Alaska. It's winter. I, okay. Let's get on a snow machine. You call it not snowmobile. Okay. That's yes. weird. I yeah. guess I'll just say that. Um, and, and then, you know, you remember, Oh, I drove a jet ski in the lakes down there in the South. That's the Four same thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, but yeah. And then next thing you know, I, I stumble my way into I did or I'd you stumble your way into into you know being the in charge of the copper basin and and helping out with these races all around Alaska and now you're just like a total like pe- the you know you, you you know people people hear your northern North Carolina accent they're like but this guy just did the entire copper basin trail on a snow machine like like twenty times in the last ten years or whatever you know it's yeah. crazy yeah it, it uh, it's amazing how how God will put you in places and, and let you see things. I'll never, never forget my first winter here. Um, down south, if it gets 10, 20, 20 degrees, you're leaving your faucet on over all night. You know, it's like, we're going to run the faucet so the, nothing freezes. And my first winter here, I'll never forget, it was 52 below zero. I stayed up all night because I didn't want pipes to freeze and bust. And, and come to find out, didn't have to because of the insulation and all that. But uh, And then the first time I ever got on a snow machine for the Copper Basin, was 35 below and it was and it was going down the Glen highway from uh, Glen Island out to Mendelta. We were going out to Mendelta. Oh yeah. Yeah. I remember man, I got to do Mendelta. And uh, we were going out there and I got stuck in overflow in one of those creeks out there and thought I was going to freeze to death. <laughs> I thought, thought my life was over out on the side of the Glen highway because I got stuck in overflow. <laughs> <laughs> now you want, you, you know, People have taught me, and, and I've learned how to how to get out, and how to, you know, make sure you don't die out here because 
It can happen, but so far we've done well. So uh, this year's race was uh, a nice end, you know, with uh, Jesse and Brent being so close. I'm sure that was nice for you to see. And uh, my question is, you know, in your experience with the race, um, how many, you know, how many have you seen that have been that close? Oh, uh, that's the first one we've seen within two minutes. Uh, wow. We kept kept watching the trackers. And you, the good thing about the Copper Basin and that and, and the finish there, you can actually run up the Richardson Highway. And so I've gone up to the Richardson to the uh, where they came off the pipeline. And I watched Brent come down. And I watched Jesse come down. And it's an hour and a half where they get to the finish. So you're talking 13 miles or something like that before they get to actually to the finish line. So I watched them for a little while going down the highway and then went back to the to the church, which is the finish line, and uh, sat there and watched the trackers. And 20 minutes later, I went back up the road and it's like, oh, man, Jesse's catching it. And you could just watch on the tracker that this is going to be close. And when Brent came around the corner, I really had no clue if Jesse had passed him or not. So – it was uh it was it was a fun race. I, I like to see I like to see a race that's that competitive. Uh, I, I I still want to see them come in um, side to side. I, I want to see that both teams come in side by side, and you're and you're measuring you know which dog which dog knows cross the finish line first. That's what I want to see. Uh yeah. man, that 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 was uh I I didn't get to see. I was you know uh, you were you not- still at Lake Louise, weren't you? I think I was, yeah. I was, I was handling for a couple other teams and uh, Sean and and uh, Matt and and, but yeah, I, I two minutes, two minutes. That's that's exciting stuff, man. Um, I got that back to back weekends too because the Connect right. two hundred yeah. the previous weekend was maybe less than two minutes. Um, and with think, Brent being in second be place that time, you know. I think it may be the reason Brent changed the sleds. I don't and know. And literally, how- no, it, it, it certainly, it yeah. Has, I mean. Yeah. He said yeah. he literally yeah. said that to my face. Okay. Yeah, he okay. yeah. he uh, and then I saw him after the race, and I was like, dude, like that. You literally won this race because you had a different sled. Like you definitely would not have won with a giant, you know, Yukon Quest one thousand yeah. sled. I mean, it just yeah. wouldn't have. So I was, I was like, he's like, he probably felt pretty good about that, and he's been rocking, yeah. like, he's been rocking that sled for ten years. This like big big like which is good for expeditions you know he's doing he's doing that a lot the iditarods an expedition you know the quest right. but yeah with these shorter d- races you don't need to sit down and even if you can sit down you like usually don't you know it's like it's, well the trail the trail may not be smooth enough for you to sit down and you you know in that section between myers lake it's nothing but s curves through trees and i don't know too many yeah. people sitting down through that section. I've there. tried. Yeah, no, I tried. <laughs> you know, it does not. Nope. Doesn't work. Turns out. But uh, yeah, I, I'm like, I, I got, I remember because I'm much for like a couple winters without like ever getting to use like these, you know, tail dragger sleds that, that have the seat. And, and, and I remember like getting to use them. I'm like, all right, sick. Like I can sit down now. And like, no, like I never, I couldn't it's rare that you would find yourself in a situation. You have to be like a 200 miles deep into something. And then the dogs are actually finally calm. And then also, by the way, you have to have a perfectly straight or slightly curvy trail, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so you've done the copper basin quest uh, from a race official standpoint, managerial standpoint. Have you done any, uh, I mean, there's a lot of different quest events. But besides, have you have you helped with Iditarod, right? Did you? I was there. I was. I went to Iditarod last year. Yeah, yeah. Nice. I've been able to, been able to go out to Iditarod last year, and, and plan is maybe go out again this year to help with a couple checkpoints this year. Um, just with with my schedule, I can't commit to you know the the big two three week time frame that you know some of these races are needing. So I do what I can with these shorter races and. But I'll go out for a week for a ride. I'll go out for the quest and help with that. And then I've done the Willow, um, the Willow the last couple of years, and uh, enjoyed going over going over to uh, to the Willow area and, and seeing how that works. And so yeah, that's pretty much the races I've done. Um, I I just 
it's not that I enjoy the dogs as much as most people do. I grew up raising beagles. So I had at one time 75 beagles. Oh, uh, you was like, like hound, uh, hounds, like yep, hunts, yep. doing hunt, hunts, hunts yep. and stuff. Rabbit, rabbit hunting. Yeah. And that, I, I got to go on a hunt with some hounds. I didn't like do the hunting or whatever, but like, I just kind of followed along. It's like, I didn't yeah. know this existed. Like, this is a crazy scene that people are doing. And I think it's like a British thing. Is there horses involved? Like, no, no, we didn't use okay. horses. We, we just, we just did rabbit hunting with, with beagles. And, and I determined that a, as a kid, I was not going to have that many dogs ever again in my life. <laughs> That's a <laughs> good lesson to learn. So, so uh, uh, you know, I've got one dog. I've got a golden retriever. And um, that's that's what I've got and that's what I deal with. But, um, no, I, you know, everybody loves loves the dogs. And I like the dogs. I like to, I like to be, but I like, uh, I like being around the people. I think, I think yeah. the dogs make the racing. I think the people that are at these different places uh, – I love going to see in history. I love going to see how other people have survived and how other people um, just live their life. I think it's uh, it's great, and it's a great opportunity to get out and to explore parts of the state and parts of the country that most people will never see. It is totally the just like the combination of all these people working towards this Copper Basin event or working towards the Quest event or the yep. Iditarod, yep. and they get there. And it's like, this is here, we're here, we're doing the thing. And there's just like an excitement, you know, it's kind of, I don't know, it feels like Christmas morning or, or Thanksgiving dinner, or I don't know what, but you know, it's just like a good feeling in the dead of winter when things are maybe a little low sometimes for some people and you go and you do, you know, and get to see all, all your friends that you saw last yeah. year and the year before that and maybe you haven't seen a couple people in five years and you get this they all are excited ever just like the energy is just so positive and then like you know races a lot of a lot of things can go down in these races that are not like could be bad if it's poorly managed or if it's yeah. um you know the the mushers don't aren't properly you know ready or the dog teams aren't properly ready and dallas said this in his speech and i thought this is a kind of a cool thing like I mean, the race just like went so smoothly, like from the front to the back of the pack. There wasn't like, I don't know, usually there's like at least a couple teams that are just like maybe, you know, they weren't quite they're signed up and there's just this is a little too much or, uh, you know, there's disorganized or unprepared. Or maybe if from the race perspective, like there's certainly races that are like that, too, that, uh, you know, aren't quite perfectly put together and not as smooth and it just seemed like such a smooth i mean by smooth i'm still mean like everybody sleep deprived you know me and jason were hanging out at the finish line and we both had a couple bags under our <laughs> eyes and having a fun yeah. fun sleep deprived conversation while i destroy some ramen noodle soup you know it was great yeah. you know it's just good yeah, times. I, I still got bags under my eyes from the copper basin this year but you know <laughs> yeah you're not sleeping any more than the mushers are no it's it's amazing because like i said you know, you go and two weeks prior to the race, nothing is working, nothing is going right. I mean, you have problems this year. I had a problem with my with my truck and had to had to actually rent a truck. Uh, the race rented a truck just to help logistics get the race going this year. And and so, but then everybody says, you know, it was a great race, and I'm going, yeah, well, this was wrong and this is wrong and this this needs to be fixed. But that's that's the backside. That's the side that the general public doesn't see. But we as a board and and us as individuals that live here go, yeah, we could have done different here. We could have done better here. And, and I think as long as we keep that attitude and we keep uh, trying to fix the things that we know are wrong, the general public may not see it. The mushrooms may never see it. Handlers will never, will never see it. But if we as a, as a community and as a race board can say, you know, if we can do better in this area, we need to. And, and we, we've done that. We, we had our end of the year meeting the Monday following the race and said, what do we need to, need to do better for next year? And how can we make the next year a better race? And I think the board that we have right now and the boards for these other races that are going on right now have done a great job of, of trying to take the, the sport of mushing, adapting it to the year into the day that we're living in and trying to make put on races that are benefiting the teams, getting them ready for the Iditarod and getting them ready for these other larger races but also trying to do what we can to encourage our community and build our communities and help our communities with, uh, with just our races, because 
Um, I'm excited to see the the growth of these these uh, younger mushers coming in. You know, you talked about the junior Iditarod, and and a 16 year old uh, young lady wins the Kinnick 200, beating out an Iditarod champion and a Quest champion by just a minute. Man, that's that's exciting for the sport, and and uh, I, we have we have a desire here in the basin to try to put out a uh, a copper basin 100th. I don't know if it'll happen this year, but uh, we're we're trying to do something just to, you know, I don't think parents can let their kids come out and run in 50 below zero out here, but maybe in the springtime come out and do a, do a copper basin 100 and, and just go 100 miles out and, and make it a fun run and just try to continue to build the sport. Nice. That's awesome. I, I remember you mentioning that at the banquet and, uh, and yeah, you know, March or April, you know, you, you make it a stage race or something during yeah. the day. It's not going to be cold. And during, during, you know, 2 PM on a, in a day in April, maybe it is, maybe it has been 50 below. I don't know, but probably, uh, probably less likely. And, yeah. uh, and I think the cool thing about like all these events is like, I mean, even, you know, Brennan, you're part of, you're part of this and, and all three of us are, but like every, every event people don't have to be there. They're not doing no. it for money. They're not no. doing it to get a good night's rest. Like, I don't even know why they're doing it, but they're doing it. Cause it's just bigger than you. It's bigger than you. It's bigger yeah. than us. And, you know, and that feels, it just is to the human spirit just feels good. Even if it's really hard and you're not getting anything out of it and to the, and like personally or selfishly, you you just every it just there's something magical and special happening at these events, you know. And uh, you know, maybe maybe not everybody is going to, you know, going to church on Sundays. But this is for these events are for church for some people, you know. This is yeah. this no, is their you. I, yeah, you know. And yeah. and it, it's uh, uh it's it's just, I still try to find my try. I'm always asking why you know why why are we doing this you know dogs love to do it that's big why you get to be in the outdoors the community it's everything but it's it's certainly it's it's not for what the rest of the world does things for which seems to be you know money and yeah. and it's 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 bigger than that so it, it's awesome and you're a huge part of it and uh i just wanted to say that and <clears throat> brennan i want you to speak because i haven't heard from you and i miss you <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, honestly, you, you're getting, you're some concluding things very beautifully there. I was waiting for you to just close it out, but I've been having this one question in my head that I've been waiting to spit out. And, you know, the conversation has gone in all these different directions, but in your role as a, a race official or race marshal, as president of the board, I'm sure that you've, you've been a part of like maybe some decision-making that is tough or like, you know, assessing someone broke the rule and now you got to like penalize them or whatever it may be. I'm just curious, you know, like if there's any stories that you want to share about that or just something. Oh, I, I mean, I won't name names. I don't want to throw nobody under the bus, but I remember I was coming, I was at a judge at uh, Two Rivers. And it may have been 2019, 2018. I don't remember. Probably had to be 19 until the race, I think, started in Whitehorse. And, and a musher came in or came into the Two Rivers checkpoint up there and, and they'd gone through overflow and their feet were frozen. And, and it's like uh, they wanted to go get boots out of their truck. Well, that's a that's a $50 fine, you know, because they didn't have an extra pair of boots. And it's like the, the the human side of me is like, just go get the boots, you know, just just go up there and get out. But, you know, the rule side says, there's no outside assistance. You get, you can't do that. There's got to be a, a fine for that. And so that's that's something that I, you know, you struggle with the human side. Like, ah, just go get them. I, I'll turn my back. I don't see it, you know. But that's not the, you know, that's there's rules for a reason. And there's and uh, that's just a story that sticks to my mind. That musher come in and goes, is there any way, Jason, I'm gonna get boots on my truck? I said, yeah, but it's gonna be, you know, either a time penalty or, or a fine, financial fine. He goes, how much is it? And I, it wasn't much. I don't remember what it was at the time. It may have been a hundred bucks or something like that. And uh, I was like, he goes, I'll do it. I said, okay, go do it. So, I mean, he went and got his, got his boots out of his truck because he needed them. 
This I want to feel my toes again, Jason. Yeah. And I want to yeah. pay that yeah. hundred dollars. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm going to lose I, all my toes for these I, for a hundred dollars. I, I didn't. The human side said, "No, yeah, go get it," but uh, I couldn't do that. So, yeah, I'm, I I don't know if you remember me and my gear situation in 2020, but you've done a lot of races, so maybe not. But I lost my axe, and then. I got to the next checkpoint. You know, an axe is a mandatory part of your gear. Yeah, yeah. You, so you lost it coming down. Uh, did you not? You lost it coming down the backside of Eagle Summit. I did. Yeah. And and uh, vividly no, I know. Actually, no, 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 no. I lost vividly. it vividly. The, <laughs> the first time I lost it was leaving. Yes, you lost yeah. it twice that race. I do remember this. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> first time I lost it was leaving Two Rivers, I believe, and I Going had a kerfuffle. Uh, no, it was just a. I, there was another team that had taken okay. a wrong turn and I'm trying to get around them. And it was just a circus. And so in that process, you know, I tipped my sled over and, you know, it was a tricky situation. And so my, I didn't know that I lost my sled for an hour or two. And then I was like, or I mean, uh, my ax. And then I, someone picked it up, it was, you know, on the military trail, got it back to me like a checkpoint or two later. I was like, all right, sick. Like I'm definitely going to fasten this thing up real nice. Like, you know, there's no way I'll lose this a second time. I mean, it is a totally b- bulletproof system that I've come up with. Anyways, so fast forward to Eagle Summit and yeah, I go down, you know, fall down to Eagle Summit. I probably, it's, it's a one mile or maybe even a half a mile or maybe even a quarter mile descent down Eagle Summit and from that direction. It wasn't like a crazy, it wasn't that crazy, but it was just trenched out sugary trail. Right. Yeah. And I had never ridden a sled dog systems trail and I just could not figure out how to stay up. I felt like probably 10 times in like that, just that downhill and then lost my ax. And then, you know, and Donna was the Donna was uh, for everyone else is, uh, been a huge part of the mushroom yeah. scene for a number of years. And as, a my mushing career she's been you know sprinkled in at a lot of those different events and uh and so yeah you know i think she ended up having or maybe it was you i don't know but i i got to the finish line without an axe i think or someone gave me an axe no no someone gave me an axe that was like a, a homie of donna yeah then, i think if i remember correctly jeff king or whoever was running jeff king's team found your axe later no, I was, I think I was, that's, I was running okay. the team. Yeah. So, okay. So you lost the ax and then somebody else brought an ax in. And yeah. uh, I think you got an ax from somebody. I, I remember the story vaguely. I do remember. Yeah. yeah and then I, I got remember the it ax. Happened, happened on Eagle Summit. Yeah. Right. No, yeah, it did. And then I, I got the ax and then I like used it. And then I, I don't know, there was some kind of similar conversation that was had on the trail to you and the two rivers you know uh 50 dollar fine or whatever i got yeah. to the finish line and they're like hey man like you did lose your mandatory gear and it, technically you do have if you want this to be like an iditarod qualifier you do have to pay us a hundred dollars yeah and i was like sitting there like you son of a gun <laughs> <laughs> are you kidding me a hundred dollars for my silly little axe come on you know and yeah, it's like it makes sense it's in the rules so it's like all right it's in the rules yeah no, I, those those decisions like that are, uh, you know, especially the plain, you know, the white white and black ones that clearly said that you had to have the mandatory gear or stuff like that. I I got you. Um, most of the time, the rules that are that I've dealt with are been pretty much plain, you know, black and white in the rules that this that this is what you have to do. This is what uh, you cannot do this. You got to do this. And uh, I, I enjoy I enjoy that side of it. I enjoy just. The interaction with the mushers and, and conversations that we get to have, you know, even you, Sean, just text them back. Even me, even you, even <laughs> you, man. Uh, you know, like you said, because you you go for a year. I go for a year. I don't live around mushers. I don't live around the mushroom community other than for these three months of the year. And you know, you uh, you see mushers, you see folks in in Lowe's and Palmer that are. It's like, hey, how you doing? And and uh, it's just. It's like family. You, you see family again that you see them for three months out of the year, but then you don't see them again. You run into them, bump into them. It's like, hey, how are you doing? And and these are people that politically we may not agree with and religiously we don't agree with, but uh, they're just, they're like family and they're friends. And, and you see them again and, 
as what I said earlier, you know, the dogs are, are huge. You know, the dogs are the sport, but the people that help the sport and the mushers and, and the race officials and just the community members that you get to meet is a huge part of, of, uh, of why I do this. And that's why Brennan ended up moving to Alaska with his wife and child. <laughs> come on. Hey, Brennan, come on up. We have a great place up here in Copper Basin. Oh, man. I love it. I love it. I got a. You got the perfect haircut, too. Hey. Let's go, baby. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, I forgot. I had another one more question, but it just slipped my mind. Um, well, Sean, did you have anything else you wanted to to ask? I know that we've kind of gotten close to an hour, or gone a little over now. Yeah, you know, I I think I'm I just closing remarks might be just it was cool because I saw Jason at the start of the Copper Basin this year, and I always like assume that you know there's just so many mushers over the years that like I'm like Jason, like hey, like do you I don't know if you remember me. And we've like, we've talked like five times, but you know, I was just still, I was like, Hey, I don't know if you're, he's like, Oh, Oh, I know who you are. Don't worry. Yeah. You know, I'm listening yeah. to your podcast. You know, that's, that's, I put that on, set the timer and I go to sleep listening to Brent, me and you, Brennan. And I was like, Oh, you know, just like getting the fact that you're like uh, hearing us blab about whatever, you know, it's cool. And it's cool to get the love from you, Jason, and from people like within the mushing community. Absolutely. Cause you know, like we're not, you know, we love to get love from people all over the world, but, you know, to be have, saying, hearing from people like you and uh, other folks that have listened to, that are running these, literally running these races. And then we're just talking crap about them, you know, while yeah. they, after they yeah. ran the race, you know, and they're like, <laughs> talking, they about us it, having, you know? talking about us not having water at sourdough. And oh, uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> did you hear, I, Brendan, I think I told you about that. Like, Loro said, uh, "What did he say, Jason? Because you probably remember it better than we do." Oh, uh, Loro, Loro was talking about. He was talking about the races he was going to run this year, and he said he wasn't going to run the Copper Basin. And 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 I think he said because you know he goes, "Who has a checkpoint that you don't have water or something like that?" He, he goes, "Who has a checkpoint you don't have a barrel of water and and a fire that you get?" He goes, "Get a sourdough and you got to melt snow." And uh, <laughs> Laura, Laura was a great guy and I gave him a hard time when he showed up here. I was like, yeah, Laura, I said, we have a rule specifically for you. You have to, it's, it's, you have to melt snow at every checkpoint this race. Uh, that's so, no, he, he, it was good. It was fun. And, uh, I, I just enjoy, uh, I enjoy your podcast. I enjoy listening to you guys. You do a great job, uh, keep, keeping the sport going and keeping folks involved in the sport. And, and I appreciate it. And, you know, like I said, it's, uh, it's just a great family and a great, great group of people that make the sport what it is. Hey, so I want to ask as normally when we wrap up, we usually ask the mushers like, Hey, can you promote yourself or where people can follow you or, or whatever it may be in your case? I don't know if, if there is much to do there, but what I was thinking, maybe a call for action on your part could be is like, maybe tell listeners how they, if they want to be involved as volunteers, what, yeah. what they could do to, to be part of your race to help out. So I'll, I'll throw it out this way. Um, my first role of being here in Alaska is the pastor of church. If you're ever coming through the, uh, Glen Allen area and you want a church to come visit, stop by and see us at Old Pass Baptist Church right at the uh, junction of the Glen and the Richardson highway. We'd love to have anybody come out and visit us there at the church. But uh, as far as volunteering for, for our race, you can go to the Copper Basin 300 uh, Facebook page or the website, and uh, there's a spot on there you can click uh, volunteer. And I don't care. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's our race or whatever race it is. If these other races need volunteers, too. I don't know how many volunteers they have, but uh, the volunteer spirit in America is something that's dying, um, and it's something that's it's going away and that's what made America what it is, is, is people helping neighbors, volunteering their time to help neighbors. And so that's, it's always been in my blood and I've tried to raise my boys that way, uh, that God, that God's given us. And so, uh, just find it, find an event or find something within your own community that you can go out and help your community be better. Nice. Hey, Amen. Yeah, that that's, 
it's true that I, I definitely have got had a couple years go by where I'm not volunteering for much, you know, or whatever. And I'm sure I'm not the only one out there, but yeah, it is. A, I, I never really thought about that, you know, volunteering that volunteer spirit did probably help build this country and is a huge part. It's, it's just kind of lost in bigger cities. You know, I think in Anchorage, even, which isn't that big of a city, there's not like as much of that sense of community. You have to really search for it. It's there. Yeah but yeah. you got to really look for it. Whereas in Glen Allen, it slaps you right in the face and yeah. uh, in the smaller communities. But yeah, that's, yeah, it's awesome that you're not, you know, you're, you're just encouraging a better world, you know, and that uh, and, and you don't necessarily need to get anything out of it. If that, if that's if all that happens, then Jason's perfectly happy. And so are me and Brennan. Yeah. Mm-hmm.